Chairperson and thank you for organizing committee for inviting me to this conference. I'm Hidenori Mimura, Research Institute of Electronics, Shizuoka University. So my title uh, today is uh, Fabrication and uh, Application of Durable CNT. So this is the uh, outline of my talk. At first, we have synthesized a durable, durable CNT. So I'll introduce our durable CNT. And then we have developed the strain sensors using the CNT web. So I'll talk about the structure of the uh, strain sensors. We have developed the uh, data group using the CNT strain sensors for finger motion detection. Then I will talk about the application of the data group to computer graphics, virtual reality, future piano lesson, and rehabilitation equipment for moving paralyzed fingers. The last is conclusion. So in Japan, uh, we believe that Dr. Ijima discovered the CNT in 1991. CNT has a cylindrical nanostructure of the graphene sheet, like this. And CNT has two types, the single wall CNT and double wall CNT. This is uh, our gross method of CNT. We use the uh, uh, CVD method. First, we put the quartz substrate and the iron chloride catalysis inside the furnace. The furnace is evacuated at the pressure of less than 0 0.1 Pascal. We heat up the furnace to the 820 degree while keeping a vacuum. And then we flow the acetylene gas. Our method is a very simple method. So in our method, multiple carbon nanotube grows on the iron catalyst. The growth occurs at the bottom of the CNT. So this is a picture of the vertical aligned CNT grows on the gold coat substrate. CNT grows every faces, top, bottom, right and left, front and back. The first surface is very flat, so it means the nanotube height is very uniform throughout the substrate. This is a SEM image of our CNT. Densely aligned CNT is grown on a coat substrate. And this is a TEM image. Our CNT is a multi-wall CNT. Our method is a rapid growth, so typically 2.1 millimeter CNT is grown for 20 minutes. The density of the CNT is uh, about from the 1 to 3 times 10 to the 9 per square centimeter. So our CNT is drawable, so we grabbed the edge of the CNT with the tweezers and just uh, pull the edge of the CNT like this. So we can fabricate the CNT web over the 60 meter without twisting. So this is a CNT web. Well, this is a, a C movie which shows the fabrication of the CNT web. Our CNT is constantly drawable. So our CNT is also a spinnable. We can fabricate the CNT yarn. So this is a CNT yarn from the web. So this figure shows how to fabricate the CNT yarn. So we attached the edge of the CNT web on the spindle on the slider. So we twist the CNT web while sliding the spindle, so backward. This yarn contains no chemical binder. Why is our CNT drawable? CNT web consists of many small CNTs. The length of the 
CNT is less than 2 mm. So short CNT fibers are connected end to end by Fandelbas force with a small overlap. So this, <coughs> so this is small overlap. So we can fabricate the various CNT product using our CNT web. We have built up the startup company and we have sold these products, a CNT tape, CNT yarns, <coughs> oh, sorry, CNT array, CNT sheet. All products are made of 100% CNT. This is a fabrication method of the CNT sheet. We wind the CNT web, so this CNT web, on the rotating drum and slide the CNT array. <coughs> uh, this slide shows a four size CNT sheet. This is 100% CNT sheet. It contains non-chemical binder and CNT is aligned in this direction. So we fabricate CNT tapes by cutting the CNT sheet like this. Using the CNT tape, we fabricated the CNT <coughs> strain sensors. So this slide shows a cross-sectional view of the developed CNT strain sensor. We put we put the <coughs> Aligned CNT tape on a polyurethane, polycarbon, polycarbonate urethane uh, substrate. This uh, aligned direction is uh, parallel to the strain direction. This is strain direction and the aligned direction is uh, parallel to the strain axis. We add here the CNT tape. Uh, to the substrate with a PAT electrode and conductive paste. We stretch the CNT tape, uh, we stretch the sensor, the resistance increased. When we release the strain, the resistance return to the initial value. So this slide shows a cyclic strain resistance characteristic of the CNT strain sensor. The resistance is linearly uh, proportional to the applied strain. The higher strain, the higher resistance. These are the optical image, optical microscope image of the surface of the strain sensor. When we stretch the strain sensor, the gap appears inside the CNT sheet. This is the reason why the resistance includes when we stretch the sensor. When we release the strain, the gap disappears and the resistance of the CNT strain sensor return to the initial value. This slide shows a dynamic strain resistance characteristic of the CNT strain sensor of a frequency of 3 hertz. Frequency of 3 hertz. The blue curve shows the applied strain the red curve shows the resistance. The resistance a change uh, follows the temporal change of the applied strain so very well. This slide shows a dynamic strain resistance characteristic of the CNT strain sensor at the frequency of 29 hertz. So resistance change follows the temporal change of the applied strain very well. Until the frequency of 30 hertz, the sensor responds fast enough. 
to detect the fine finger motions. So we have fabricated the data group with a built-in CNT strain sensor. These are CNT strain sensors. These CNT strain sensors detect the angle of fingers. The data group connects the data of the finger motions and the, uh, the, this data group collects the data of the finger motions from the angle of the fingers. Uh, this is a demonstration to collect the data of the finger motion and apply them to the computer graphic image. So data group can collect the data of the fine figure motions and the computer graphic image almost perfectly reproduce the finger motions. This is a CNT strain sensor. Thin and stretchable and light. So when we stretch the CNT strain sensor, the resistance increased. And when we release the strain, the resistance decreases. So this is a data group. This is also the data group. So from now, I'll show the demonstration of the motion capture using the data group. This is a data group. So the Camera, so captures the movement of the whole body. However, the finger motions cannot be captured with the camera because there are some blind spots in the fingers. So the data group uh, captures the finger motions. And this is a demonstration of the virtual reality using the data group. So he grabs some parts and moves them in the battle space. So this slide shows a demonstration of the future piano lesson. So this is a data group. So data group detection detects the data of the uh, fingers. This is an exoskeleton. So kind of the robot. So data group detects the finger motions of the teacher. Data group, so the detects the finger motions of the teachers and transfers the data to the exoskeleton. Oh, this is the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton reproduces the teacher's finger motion on the uh, student side. So this is a student. Okay. So the student, 
so easily knows so how to play the piano. Okay, so I'll talk about the rehabilitation equipment for the moving the uh, paralyzed patient due to the stroke or spinary injury by using the data group. Some paralyzed patient uh, due to the stroke of the uh, spinary injury have trouble to move uh, their fingers at his will. I'll show the rehabilitation system using the data group for moving the uh, paralyzed fingers. So let's say the uh, right hand is a normal hand. So why is the left hand is a uh, paralyzed hand? The patient cannot move his paralyzed left hand fingers at his will. Uh, however, when the proper electric stimulation is applied to the paralyzed left hand, the left hand fingers can be automatically moved, even though the patient cannot move his left hand fingers at his will. Using this uh, property, we have constructed the rehabilitation system for moving the paralyzed fingers. In the step one, at first, the patient puts a data group on the both his hand. The patient so makes a each finger posture from one to five like this. So with his normal hand, so the first, so the right hand, so makes the postures like postures. So data group detected the data. So this data group so detected the data of the finger postures and registers the data of each uh, finger postures. So in the PC, when the posture one is the data R1. So when the posture two is the data R2. So merge electrode. Uh, four times six electrodes, which are placed on the inner side of the forearm, so like this. The PC selected one active electrode and one return electrode out of the 24 electrodes. So there are 552 combinations to choose a pair of uh, active and return electrodes. In the step two, a fence current pulse is applied to the active electrode. The paralyzed left hand uh, automatically moves the fingers. So data group, data group detects the data of the fingers and registers the data of the each finger in the PC. So 550 data uh, from L1 to L522 are registered in the PC. Comparing R1 to R5 with so L1 to L552, the best combination of active electrode and return electrode is selected for the each posture of one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, for the posture one, so this combination, this combination is selected. Uh, for example, uh, this is a return electrode, this is active electrode. Uh, similarly, for the posture two, so this combination is selected. So this is a, a return electrode, this is active electrode. Uh, for the fossil three is a uh, active electrode. This is active electrode. This is a return electrode, and this combination is selected. The four is like this, and the five fossil is like this. So in step three, uh, 
Uh, for example, feather, normal right hand makes a posture one. At his will, a current pulse is applied to the active electrode in the combination selected for the posture one. A combination, uh, electrode combination is uh, selected for the posture one. So this is active electrode, this is a uh, return uh, electrode, so the electric pulse is applied to this active electrode. Then, paralyzed left hand automatically makes a posture one. At the moment, a paralyzed patient uh, try to bend his thumb finger, some fingers of the paralyzed left hand strongly. Similarly, uh, when the normal right hand makes the fossa three, a current pulse is applied to the active electrode in the combination selected for, for the fossa three. In the fossa three, the, this combination is selected. This is active electrode, so the pulse is uh, applied to this active electrode. And then the paralyzed left hand automatically makes a fossa three. At the moment, the paralyzed patient tried to bend his middle finger of the paralyzed left hand strongly. Uh, similarly, when the normal right hand makes a fossa five, a current pulse is applied uh, to the active electrode uh, for the combination in the combination selected for the fossa five. So that this is active electrode for the uh, electric pulse is applied to this active electrode. And then the paralyzed left hand automatically makes a posture five. At the moment, the paralyzed patient tried to bend his little finger over the left hand strongly. When this uh, rehabilitation is continuous, the nerve of the brain uh, come to connect the motor muscle of the paralyzed left hand sometimes. So this is one of the experimental result. The normal right hand uh, makes a posture. As when the current pulse applied to the active electrode, the paralyzed left hand makes the same posture uh, as the posture made of the right hand. So. This is a, a fossa one, this is a fossa two, this is a fossa three, this is a fossa four, this is a fossa five. So the paralyzed left hand uh, makes the same fossa as the right hand. Okay, so let me summarize my talk. So we have synthesized so durable CNT by the one step CVD method. So you have developed the strain sensors using the CNT web. So we have fabricated the data group for finger motion detection. So we have applied the data group to the several applications such as the computer graphics, virtual reality, future piano lesson, and rehabilitation equipment for the moving the paralyzed fingers. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Professor Nimura, for your very interesting talk. And uh, so until Professor Tiginano will reach his office, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions to the presentation. May I ask a question? Yes, please, Professor Goshnov. Yeah, I am Boris Goshnov. Hello to everybody. My question is about the data gloves. When you, when one uses these gloves uh, many times, mm -hmm. how reproducible are the changes of the resistivity or whatever? Do they degrade? Because the context between the CNTs, they of course change their properties. Mm -hmm. So how do I yeah, so it's a, in my case, so the, our, our strain sensor is very, very stable. It's a characteristic, it's a, so does not change so much, uh, does not change. Mm. 
So the uh, data group, so I use the data group, it's uh, okay, yeah, almost so one year. It's uh, so the still, it's the same character, shows the same characteristics. Great, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, then we will thank again Professor Hidenori Mimura for his talk. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, thank you very much. So, Professor Palikarakis, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation, and uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today and join uh, all the other speakers uh, in the celebration of uh, Professor Victor Sotea for his uh, 70th uh, anniversary. Uh, I was uh, lucky to, to have a collaboration with him in a European project, and uh, I know uh, that he is a great man and a fantastic personality that uh, contributed a lot in the field of biomedical engineering, clinical engineering. After this very interesting presentation of Professor Mimura, I will address a, a completely different subject, and that is the role of uh, clinical engineers uh, in the hospitals. And uh, in this uh, role, uh, Professor Victor Sontea played uh, in the recognition of this role, Professor Sontea played a big, uh, has a big, uh, let's say, contribution uh, during uh, the last uh, 30 or more years. Uh, I spent a few hours to prepare a video recording of my speech, and uh, although I'm not so happy with the result, you allow me to, to use this video and then answer to the questions. So I will move to the video now. I think we have some problems, but we will soon be back. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to participate again this year in the fifth edition of this very successful series of international conferences on nanotechnologies and biomedical engineering. And I would like to thank the organizing committee and particularly the professors Ion Igianu and my friend Victor Sonte for this invitation. I'm sad from the other side that uh, this uh, conference is not a face-to-face -face event due to COVID-19, but I hope that in the near future, the next edition will happen uh, in, as in the past uh, uh, on a face-to-face -face basis, and we will be happy to enjoy the event. I'm coming from of Patras and uh, the Biomedical Technology Unit that has been created in um, 1989 and uh, the research topics and the field of biomedical engineering is preoccupied uh, is X-ray medical image reconstruction and simulation, also biomedical instrumentation and measurements with uh, focusing on biosensors. And uh, the clinical engineering, medical technology management, mm -hmm. including healthcare technology assessment and vigilance. Also, uh, in uh, 1991, we created the Institute of Biomedical Technology as a non-profit organization uh, aiming to support the development of biomedical technology sector in Greece. The main product that we produce uh, are concerning medical device management systems and uh, particularly now in the fifth edition of such systems is the web praxis and also we provide services concerning nomenclature uh, inventory uh, studies on uh, investment planning for hospitals and uh, regional healthcare systems uh, acceptance testing and so on we have a very long collaboration with WHO, and uh, this has been reinforced during the last 10 years with uh, uh, Adriana Velasquez taking the lead of the medical device sector. And we had also during the economic uh, crisis uh, in Greece, uh, during the last five years, a very closer collaboration with the Greek uh, office of WHO 
uh, on several studies on in vitro diagnostics on high value capital equipment in healthcare in Greece and uh, uh, specification on some uh, kind of medical device and uh, such as uh, hip and uh, knee replacement uh, and uh, other implants and also we organize a workshop and uh, some reports on health technology assessment implementation in Greece. You will all agree that healthcare today is technology driven and team-based. Uh, the medical devices that are appearing uh, in an accelerated pace during the last uh, 20 years uh, are the results of research of uh, university labs, uh, of institutes, of independent organizations and from the activities of WHO. Uh, there are also regulatory bodies that uh, they are looking to the legal framework, applying the legal framework for putting medical devices on the markets and uh, the competent authorities and the notified bodies, they are playing a crucial role in this procedure. Uh, from the other side, we have the medical device manufacturers and the decision makers of the healthcare systems that uh, they decide on the use of medical designs and uh, the devices and uh, finally the devices are used in the hospitals and uh, patients. Speaking about uh, health technologies, we mean any intervention that may be used to promote health, to prevent, diagnose or treat diseases or for rehabilitation purposes. This includes pharmaceuticals, devices, procedures, and organizational systems used in healthcare. Medical devices are part of this health technology, with uh, a very starting from very simple devices like uh, masks that are used during the last period uh, for COVID-19 very intensively. Uh, to ceilings uh, and uh, catheters and so on, going to medical equipment that are more complicated uh, devices uh, and uh, including in vitro uh, diagnostics, uh, implantable devices and active implantable devices or uh, high value capital medical equipment that it is uh, the most cost, let's say, costly uh, technology in use today. The device uh, industry is a very active sector. Uh, actually, it, uh, as it is estimated to, is that it is uh, beyond the 400 billion euros per year with more than 500,000, uh, probably 1 million uh, medical technologies registered today. And uh, in this sector, the European medical technology industry is very active one uh, with more than 25 medical technology companies uh, in, in Europe uh, providing uh, products of uh, almost one third of the world production and very active in research uh, as it is demonstrated by the more than 12,000 patents registered every year in Europe. Uh, health technology. Actually, health technology is uh, the first one in terms of uh, uh, patents uh, deposited uh, today going uh, uh, almost double than the one of pharmaceuticals or biotechnology uh, patents. Overall health technology life cycle starts with an initial idea and uh, with R&D that goes on in its own uh, circle with development, testing, evaluation, redesign, and specification of a prototype that then goes to preclinical uh, testing. And then if everything is successful, we can speak about an innovation. And if this innovation is a, a new technology, then it has to go through clinical studies to prove that it is uh, a safe and uh, efficient to be used in humans. And if everything is again successful, 
uh, we have the submission of uh, the dossier for regulatory approval to the appropriate authority. And uh, if uh, uh, the technology follows the regulation standards, directives, and uh, uh, good manufacturing practice, and everything that it is uh, demanded by the regulations, uh, they get. Uh, they get approval for this technology and be able to manufacture to have a product that is put on the market and used in a clinical or environment or by the patient themselves. In cases that uh, these devices are medical equipment then uh, that are used in the hospital environment, the clinical engineering come into the scene and clinical engineering departments are responsible for the procurement, planning of medical equipment, investment, procurement processes, management, vigilance, and so on. And finally, the technology, if it becomes obsolescence, has to be uh, taken out of, of use. And this is also a decision where clinical engineers are play, playing a big role. Finally, uh, in another cycle, when enough information and evidence is available. We have health technology assessment that uh, leads to reimbursement of the most efficient and cost effective technologies to be used by the uh, healthcare systems in uh, every country. There are three pillars that are addressing safety and effectiveness of medical devices. The first one concerns regulation and uh, it is uh, mainly addressing issues of um, demands on placing a medical device on the market according to its safety, performance, efficacy and so on. Uh, in the European Union we have the new regulation and the implementation of post-market surveillance and vigilance systems. The second pillar concerning management of uh, medical uh, devices and equipment, starting from procurement, going to maintenance, vigilance, training, and again safety during use. And uh, here the uh, role of clinical engineering is uh, very important. And finally, we have the assessment that also looks to safety after uh, quite uh, uh, for a number of years evidence is uh, available and clinical and cost effectiveness as well as ethics and uh, social issues. In the legal framework in Europe, uh, we had in the past uh, the uh, three directives in the 90s on active implantable medical devices, the medical devices in general in uh, 1993 and the in vitro di diagnostics later on, uh, with, uh, together with guidelines on the use of uh, these uh, directives and harmonized standards that uh, devices have to fulfill in order to get approval to be on the market. Uh, due to some um, uh, cases of uh, failures and adverse events that happen and uh, with the occasion of the last one with uh, breast implants, the uh, European Union decided to pass from uh, uh, directives to a more strict um, uh, legal framework uh, and uh, they produced the regulations that are uh, necessary to become uh, national law uh, in the member states and so in uh, 2017 we have the 745 uh, regulation on medical devices and the 746 on in vitro diagnostics. So now the medical devices uh, have to fulfill these uh, re regulations in order to be able to put the C mark and uh, be uh, accepted to all uh, European uh, national markets. Due to COVID-19, the application of these regulations have to be postponed and exceptions have been introduced to face urgent needs of medical devices. The picture uh, demonstrates the need for management. The health technology care unit should ensure that the equipment function as intended by the manufacturers and the key role uh, towards achieving this goal is uh, the role of clinical engineering departments. The main purpose of uh, these departments is to maximize the benefits of medical uh, technology 
to come uh, directly to the patients and uh, ensure the safe, effective and efficient use of medical equipment. In order to demonstrate the, how clinical engineers are uh, really a partner, very important partner in managing a hospital for hospital managers, uh, we have to look at the different tasks that clinical engineering departments are fulfilling. Uh, starting from the investment planning, going to purchase of medical equipment, where the technical specification is one of the most critical issues in a call for tender. Then when uh, the hospital has decided uh, on the uh, equipment that uh, is going to uh, procure, uh, acceptance testing is necessary, creation of uh, also of a continuous updated inventory using correct nomenclature is of great importance. Then it comes the maintenance uh, part uh, with preventive and corrective maintenance, uh, the user training in order to assure that uh, the equipment uh, is used correctly, the vigilance and post-market surveillance, and finally the equipment disposal when the technology becomes obsolete. In all these steps and tasks, a lot of data are generated and if uh, a KPI uh, are used, they can provide very important uh, information for a hospital manager, but also for evidence uh, for, uh, to be used in health technology assessment. Uh, quickly, to these different uh, tasks, uh, the first one in equipment planning and uh, for uh, uh, acquisition, uh, clinical engineers are uh, very important, play a very important role in its analysis, technical evaluation, financial evaluation, comparative assessment of medical equipment. Procurement phase, uh, as I said already, the preparation of technical specifications is very important for the call for tender in order to be sure that you are the, the hospital acquires what really needs and not something much uh, something is that is much more expensive or less performant on the contrary that the one it is um, necessary for this uh, hospital i will just use the slides for the complete and uh, complete uh, of my presentation, but I will go quickly through them in uh, summary. Acceptance testing is also very important because the hostel has to know if it really receives what uh, has been ordered to by uh, during the uh, uh, contract uh, phase uh, and what is delivered by the manufacturer or the representative. And uh, uh, then a uh, very is the inventory that uh, has to uh, be continuously updated so that uh, the hostel knows exactly what uh, is um, really uh, uh, his uh, equipment, uh, let's say, uh, available in the hostel uh, in order to treat uh, correctly the patients in a safe and uh, uh, efficient way. Uh, the importance of uh, the inventory became uh, uh, very clear, especially during the pandemic, where the hospitals and the national healthcare systems in general needed to have a clear picture of the available equipment and especially the crucial one for COVID-19 treatment in order to estimate the uh, real needs for additional equipment and be able to reallocate them when necessary. Just some more details, uh, needs, uh, the need for medical equipment inventory is very important because uh, it provides a real-time and clear view of the available equipment, allows correct strategic planning and uh, knowing the existing equipment and uh, versus the real needs that uh, are necessary. Uh, it is the basis for the management of uh, medical equipment and also the basis for vigilant purposes 
uh, to know uh, if uh, equipment that are recalled uh, by the authorities and the manufacturers uh, are also available in uh, the inventory of the medical uh, uh, devices in the hospital and take the appropriate steps to take uh, all, all the necessary actions and uh, uh, correct uh, the devices that are faulty. Preventive uh, maintenance improves the operational conditions and uh, increases the reliability of the equipment, prolongs the useful uh, lifetime and uh, also prevents serious faults and adverse events. And uh, also, uh, of course, uh, uh, whatever is uh, the uh, equipment, corrective maintenance sometimes comes and it is necessary in order to uh, repair the equipment uh, and uh, give them a game safe to be used uh, by the users. The decision on uh, what is the procedure to, to follow the corrective maintenance is a critical, is very critical for many reasons in, in uh, the hospital, safety reasons, but also cost effectiveness reasons. And I would give you an example uh, on how clinical engineering departments can uh, be very active in this field. Uh, here is a, a case study uh, on the decision on what type of service contract uh, uh, should be used by hospitals. It's a, from a hospital in Greece, uh, uh, Soteria uh, Hospital in, in Greece, and they study uh, an alternative uh, ways of um, uh, having uh, corrective maintenance um, in their uh, equipment of bronchoscopes and endoscope washers. And uh, the three alternative scenarios were the existence of a contract on a case to ba case basis. So when uh, there is a need of uh, corrective maintenance to call the representative to correct it uh, uh, or to have a partial contract uh, so that preventive maintenance is included but not corrective maintenance. Corrective maintenance is uh, also on call and have uh, also uh, at the end the most full maintenance contract including spare parts and uh, uh, rules for limited downtime uh, available. Try these uh, three different systems in um, uh, five uh, units like this in, uh, for a period of uh, four years. They had uh, groups of five uh, units in each uh, category and uh, they estimated the uh, costs. They found out that uh, during the first uh, two scenarios, uh, the total uh, days out uh, were more than 1,000 for the five uh, days per year for the five equipment. Uh, so uh, 50 percent, uh, more than 50 percent of the equipment were uh, out of use uh, during this period due to uh, corrective and preventive maintenance uh, procedures on call. And uh, the third scenario has uh, really almost uh, zero down downtime uh, and this is um, uh, compared to the to the cost of uh, <clears throat> the different scenarios uh, this is the interesting scenario that could be used why uh, because in in fact uh, uh, in spite of uh, the expenses that they were almost double uh, compared to the first uh, scenario of case-to-case uh, -case call, uh, the net income uh, from the possibility to use uh, the full, uh, to take the full benefit of these uh, devices were more, were more than uh, or almost 3 million euros uh, with the uh, days off uh, that, uh, of zero days off that they had. So, in fact, the hostels, by spending twice or 150,000 euros per year for these devices, they had uh, a double net income, continuous operation of the equipment, and zero patient waiting. 
that's very important, I think, as, as, a, as an example. demonstrates that spending a little bit more for, um, uh, for uh, maintenance and having maintenance uh, uh, contracts uh, where appropriate, of course, uh, can provide you more uh, income for the hospital. Also, quality assurance and safety tests, like el electrical safety, for instance, is very important in order to assure that the equipment continues to be e functioning as intended by the manufacturer. And uh, user training is another very important uh, factor that uh, clinical engineers are playing an important role. Because clinical engineers, knowing very well the uh, devices, they can also uh, play a role of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, coaches uh, for the users to uh, correctly use the devices. And as it was acknowledged by the European uh, uh, Commission, uh, it was estimated that about 10% of patients admitted in a hospital were uh, exposed to adverse events. Uh, about one third of them, of them were associated with infections, but uh, many others with uh, uh, user errors, uh, medication-related errors, or um, surgical errors, or errors in, in diagnosis, but also to some medical device uh, uh, So risk management and uh, vigilance is also an important uh, uh, task for biomedical uh, engineers in the hostile environment. And uh, if we want to see what type of adverse events uh, could happen in the hostile environment, as I said already, medication is uh, a, in, in the clinical process is one of the most important but also failures of medical devices uh, is uh, uh, also one of the reasons. And uh, this is because even the best designed products uh, could potentially fail in the clinical practice and uh, pro uh, produce or cause serious problems to patients or even the users uh, in, uh, in the clinical staff. The purpose of a vigilance system has been acknowledged of, uh, from the European Union and uh, the, most of the uh, developed countries and their systems that uh, have been uh, put on, in place in order to avoid uh, at least the repetition uh, the same type of uh, uh, adverse events to happen again. And this uh, system in Europe uh, includes um, uh, the competent authorities, the manufacturers and the users. And uh, there are two reporting uh, systems, uh, the user reporting system from the users to the competent authority when a failure uh, of a medical device is uh, on the basis of uh, an, an adverse event that caused uh, serious problems or death of a patient. And uh, also from the users, uh, uh, the information goes through the post-market surveillance to the manufacturers. Uh, finally, the competent authorities and the manufacturers are collaborating together to analyze and uh, invest uh, in investigate the uh, case of uh, medical device failure and the adverse event in order to decide whether or not uh, the medical uh, equipment has or device has to be recalled uh, uh, and uh, take the necessary steps uh, in order to avoid the repetition of uh, such an adverse event in the future. Finally, coming to the equipment uh, disposal. Uh, this could happen due to changes in standards or, or the technology, probably a new technology that is more cost effective and more safe uh, and efficient uh, uh, will impose the uh, change and uh, the replacement of an existing technology or uh, other factors like safety or problems with uh, cost of uh, frequent uh, and expensive uh, uh, repairs uh, could uh, 
lead to replacement of a technology. And uh, the critical decision should be evidence-based and uh, information coming from the clinical engineering department and management systems is uh, uh, the most critical one in taking such decisions from the uh, hospital. Just uh, uh, to uh, complete this picture, uh, it is necessary today to for the departments of clinical engineering to use computerized uh, maintenance management systems um, in order to be able to manage all this uh, um, uh, information that it is uh, available and data and uh, retrieve this data in such a way that uh, critical uh, Finally, before uh, ending my presentation, just a few words on health technology assessment. That is a multidisciplinary process, uh, uh, summarizing information about medical, uh, social, technological, economic, and ethical, ethical issues related to the use of uh, health technology. Uh, in an unbiased, transparent, and robust uh, So, as a tool, Health technology assessment provides information and evidence on technical characteristics, and here the role of clinical engineering is very important. Comparative clinical effectiveness, comparative cost effectiveness between technologies, health delivery organizational aspects, but also legal uh, aspects and uh, social and uh, ethical implication of a technology. I hope uh, that uh, finishing my presentation that uh, clinical engineering departments have a key role in cost-effective and evidence-based overall management of medical equipment and also in reducing adverse incidents uh, through safety testing and the implementation of a reliable medical devices vigilance system. So I repeat the title of my presentation, Clinical Engineering Provide an Invaluable Contribution in Modern Hospital Management. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope next it will be in a face-to-face -face basis. Thank you again. We'll pass now to the next presentation. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Rainer Radelung from Kiel University, Germany. Uh, Professor Radelung, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. And I'm very sad not to be there in Chisinau. Um, I would uh, congratulate Professor Shonta and uh, express my uh, thanks to this long uh, collaboration. If I'm not mistaken, I think I'm also since 2011 continuously on all this nice um, ICNBME conferences, which brings together nanotechnology and biomedical engineering. So um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, in order to save uh, uh, time, I think I start now um, right away. Well, the title is um, yeah, about negligible mass of uh, graphene, which is applied for repeatable air explosions and instant sterilization. So something between nanotechnology and biomedical engineering. Well, um, yeah, here a very brief outline. Uh, so uh, first it's about how to build an aero material, which is the basis of this explosions. And I uh, would like to talk a little bit about the unique properties of aero materials. And then I would like to come to the um, properties and applications of materials which have almost no heat capacity. So um, where I'm coming from is Kiel. Kiel is uh, in the north of Germany. Uh, so we are located here uh, close to this shipyard, uh, which is manufacturing, for example, fuel cell driven submarines. Um, I'm very sad, as I said, that I cannot make the uh, way here from Kiel to uh, Kishinau, but uh, now you have also an idea where at the Baltic Sea Kiel is located. Well, 
Um, what is the basis of these arrow materials um, I, I will talk about? The basis is the material zinc oxide, which you can see as a ceramics, as a 2,6 semiconductor. So, um, yeah, uh, it is shown here how the atomic structure is. So you have layers of zinc and layers of oxygen uh, arranged in a versite uh, uh, structure. Uh, it's a white band gap semiconductor. I do not want to repeat all these properties. Um, however, it's also considered as a biomaterial, which might be interesting in this conference as well. And you can utilize this as a nanomaterial very well because uh, shaping it in various forms is easy with the zinc oxide. This is because if you're growing zinc oxide, then uh, these C axis you see here in this crystal structure is growing very rapidly. As soon as you form a layer of zinc, immediately oxygen, if it's around, will uh, settle down on that uh, due to the high polarity and then zinc comes and so on. So it basically shoots out in the C axis. And uh, if we do similar like Professor Mimura was showing um, very nicely in his um, um, talk, um, the uh, uh, catalyst particles of gold can be, for example, placed on a zinc grain. If you heat the whole thing in an oven, then you get the growth, in this case, not of carbon, but of zinc. And you can see here that this zinc grows in very thin wire types of structures. They're single crystalline, but due to the nanoscale, they're very flexible because they're very thin. So like glass fibers, which you can easily bent and we employed this method since now over 10 years so approximately 15 years uh, to grow various structures mainly structures where you have tetrapods so like this structure you see here in the camera in this in this model forming then uh, materials which grow together uh, on the macroscopic size you see here it's uh, for example scale of 100 micrometers 0.1 millimeters and it forms a, a three-dimensional construct out of these tetrapods. If we zoom in and depending on the growth conditions, these tetrapods, where uh, here these arm diameters are, uh, yeah, starting from micrometers, going all the way down to the nanoscales, are interconnecting the individual um, um, tetrapods and give it a very flexible network. So this uh, diameter is 50 to 100 nanometers, for example. Um, however, to, um, yeah, even though we uh, do research on that for now almost 15 years, still um, it's of high interest and we can use these uh, fascinating properties of the material quite a lot. So uh, from uh, last year cover stories, there's a nice mixture between nanotechnology and biomedical um, applications. So, uh, for example, um, as this year a story came out where we use these tetrapods in wound patches for antiseptic properties and for targeted protein relief. However, today I would like to talk more about the physical properties, which can be applied for healthcare as well, uh, as they're um, now just published in the current cover story of uh, materials today issue. So uh, behind that uh, zinc oxide is uh, Yogendra Kuma Mishra. He's now professor in Denmark, but he was uh, over 10 years uh, doing performing his habilitation in my group here in Kiel. So um, if you're interested in zinc oxide and the properties, I can recommend his review article from 2018 about tetrapodal zinc oxide. However, how is the growth uh, um, um, occurring? So uh, you can see here a view in the oven how we grow this zinc oxide networks, these tetrapodal networks. It's fairly simple. You have inside here a crucible where you put in some zinc grains plus a polymer, which you can just decompose. Uh, uh, could be any polymer which is um, um, attracted to oxygen and burns at the same time. So we call it sacrificial polymer. This is controlling the um, oxygen depletion inside of the oven. And then um, at the same time, the zinc is molten, evaporated, and can participate. And if you look the so often, depending on the growth conditions, you get even larger crystals or smaller crystals, these uh, tetrapodal layers. 
On the large scale, our startup company, Fistone, is um, um, uh, uh, working on that. As you can see here, the ruler sticking in this material, it's really mass producible. So in order to give a, a kind of more uh, distinct shape and uh, control the properties, you can take this tetrapodal powder, which is loosely held together, you can compress it a little bit. And in this way, you can uh, make templates for sintering it in various shapes. So after the sintering, you see that also some tetrapod arms are here sintered together as interconnects. And in this way, you can have a lot of different shapes, for example, ring shape or uh, some um, um, rods, uh, for example, for tensile tests and so on. So you're very flexible in dealing with this material. However, for this talk, this material is again only a sacrificial template. So if you take the structure and if you would look inside, you would see all these tetrapods on the micro scale. And um, it's yeah, almost 10 years ago uh, when we were working with uh, Professor Karl Schulte from the uh, Technical University of Hamburg uh, together and Matthias Mecklenburg, they have found a process uh, where uh, similar like carbon nanotube grows, you can grow a uh, graphite structure on this zinc oxide in a CVD reactor. By adding hydrogen, you're reducing the surface of the zinc oxide and at elevated um, temperatures, you have then molten zinc on the surface. And this is a nice catalyst for uh, carbon precursors and growth of graphene layers is occurring and forming then uh, nanoscopic uh, arm diameters. Here you see the synthesis, which is stopped right in the middle of the process. So you see still here some zinc oxide sticking in there, but also some hollow tetrapod arms already. And finally, you have then a construct which is entirely consisting out of um, hollow uh, nanoscopic vault uh, um, graphite or graphene um, um, tetrapods. The macroscopic uh, view on this is entirely black. If you imagine that light comes in, uh, some is absorbed on this nanoscale graphene, others scattered, but it will never come back. Uh, to the eye or to the light source, so it's an entirely black material. It's hydrophobic, but its re most remarkable structure, uh, uh, structural property is its high porosity or ultra light weight. So if you have a cubic centimeter out of this material, and if you place it in yeah, air, air is all around, is going through this, it has a lot of free space where air goes in. The air would uh, have a weight of one gram per cubic centimeter. So you're adding to this weight only 0.18 milligram per cubic centimeter in the most ideal case. So basically, you're comparable with the density of this aero material um, of the ambient air. And it translates to 99.991% porosity in this case. So meaning that the material is really almost not there. However, you see it can absorb light uh, and it is um, a conductive material. So uh, some immediate properties can be illustrated here. Here you see how this arrow material is compressed. It's black in between here, uh, uh, these two plates. It's compressed down. And now uh, the arm is moved up again. And you see it unfolds itself, which uh, points uh, um, to a certain robustness. And uh, you can see here, if you do an electrostatic experiment, uh, you see how fast it can bounce up and down without being destroyed. So here this experiment is based on um, static electricity. So you have some um, electrons uh, um, here charged up on this uh, polymer stick. And now it's attracting this uh, conductive material and it bounces around till it has lost all this um, um, charges which are applied here. So it's polarizable in this way as well. And uh, robust, I would say, black. And you can heat it, for example, in vacuum or in air. Uh, in vacuum, you can heat it uh, uh, up to a couple of thousand degrees C. So what's the secret of this robustness? Well, we revealed this with Nicola Pugno and uh, yeah, um, Donald Arts. Uh, 
here on 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 this uh, um, nice um, atomic force microscope instrument inside of an SEM. You see here how this tip is now pressing to an arm. This arm is folded, and you can see it here in this magnification. I hope you can see my my pointer um, where the circle is around. So it folds down, but it comes back after uh, releasing the force. So here in this macroscopic model, the same is going to occur. So you have an instability that it's buckling, but it's snapping back to its place. And uh, this was revealed here uh, by um, simulations and understanding and concepts of Nicola Pony. So, uh, yeah, mm, last time uh, when uh, we could have a nice uh, uh, conference, um, in Moldova, I presented you some optical properties, which are uh, basically uh, originating from the hierarchy of the material. So beside uh, graphene, you can, for example, depositing boron nitride on the surface. And then instead of a black material, you uh, get uh, some uh, transparent uh, material, which is um, yeah, uh, scattering the light and uh you can see it here in a magnification uh the trick of the scattering is that you can apply it even to scatter laser light so if you come with a red green and blue laser all this adds up then to white light and uh what's behind this light scattering well it's um kind of illustrated here if you scatter the light on this um arrow boron nitride material uh, if uh, it's reflected on such a wall or scattered on such a wall, which is at least on the nanoscale a quantum mechanical phenomena, um, it follows a kind of random pathway through the material and uh, takes long time till it comes out. If it's a little bit uh, a different way the photon is scattered, then it comes to a completely different target. And in this way, even the speckle pattern of the laser is reduced and is not not there and you can tune this diffusion and uh yeah this was a very nice uh, meeting last time and uh yeah then um it started um to continue on other uh, topics which are um uh yeah speciality of moldova which is aero gallium nitride um ion tegenyanu is, is is performing since long time in his group and Nicely with Boris and and Jon, uh, we had a publication, for example, on uh, terahertz shielding, so that you are employing these materials also on a completely different way. So with CVD and these templates, you can do a lot of stuff. And if you're interested in this to apply your CVD method, maybe on this type of templates, I'm very happy to provide some if you wish. Another way without CVD uh, to uh, yeah, put nanomaterials into these templates and removing the templates is a wet chemical approach. So in the graphene flagship, as illustrated here in this movie, you can drop in some graphene suspensions, which are soaked up here by this zinc oxide network. And this uh, graphene nicely folds around the uh, individual tetrapods. And if you're etching away the tetrapods at the end you're ending up again with a network of tetrapods uh interconnecting and uh, extreme uh, thin uh, graphene uh, uh, walls um, of these um, um, uh, tetrapods are resembled um by the graphene and you can see it here by removing one arm that it's hollow inside and you have uh, a very nanoscopic wall thickness while the arm diameters is something like between two and three nanometers. So, and what's remarkable about this? Well, we have a uh, very low uh, weight, and uh, this means that we have very low heat capacity. I can use this maybe as a board just to illustrate it. The heat energy you're adding, delta Q, is related to the temperature. So we have the heat capacity times delta t oops sorry i'm drawing here with a mouse so this is a t um so um, uh, um basically it's proportional and this heat capacity uh 
is based on the specific heat capacity times the mass of the material. So the specific heat capacity is of course a constant and the mass is extremely lightweight, meaning that if you're adding a little um, energy, the temperature goes up dramatically because if you see then that delta T, cancel again, delta T, oops, delta T, is the heat contribution delta Q divided by specific heat uh, uh, capacity times the mass of the material. And if the mass is close to zero, you have a very high temperature with very low energy. And this is what uh, we, we employed. And uh, the first uh, hints that this could, could work uh, were in a collaboration with uh, Jan Schäfer from the uh, ENP in Greifswald. I was telling him, well, our material is almost perfect black body. And then he said, okay, if this is the case, that's fine, because then we can have here a plasma torch and we can have the aerographite and go on with the um, infrared camera and see a mirror image of this torch here in the in the aerographene aerographite material you can see here a movie where you see with the infrared camera the heating of this of this flame because immediately it gets warm by the infrared radiation but there is a kind of no heat conductivity in the material you've seen it it's extremely lightweight and consisting out of all these tubes barely interconnected and so therefore the heat conductivity is very uh, low so that's very um, um, interesting um, for, for that mm. so um, yeah um, yeah and uh, there's another possibility and that's what uh, I want to talk about in the last 10 minutes which is that you can also actively heat the material so uh, this is uh, uh, basically done by Dr. Schütt and Dr. Rasch. They're the first authors of this uh, um, uh, currently uh, published uh, materials today uh, 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 paper. And it's basically, as you see here, I hope you can, you can see my pointer. Um, uh, on the left, uh, you put some power to this network. Inside these blue dots should be, for example, the nitrogen molecules from the ambient atmosphere. Um, um, uh, being inside of this uh, aero material. Now, if you do a joule heating with a very short pulse, for example, one millisecond, the whole temperature shoots up immediately. For example, you stop at 400 degrees C, but at the same time, also the air inside gets warm. So the heat transfer is very fast because it's almost the same heat uh, um, um, capacity of both materials. And if air gets hot, it expands. So it shoots out. So like an explosion and it's immediately cooling. So even in a couple of hundred milliseconds, it's cooled down to 20 degrees C uh, later on. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, artist animation, which is totally ridiculous. So uh, this is not probably how a uh, nitrogen molecule looks, uh, looks like, but it should just illustrate the air shoots out and the whole stuff gets cold again. So we have seen this is because of the structure. So you have uh, yeah, the tubes which have a microscopic diameter, but only nanoscopic walls from, from graphene. So uh, they are forming this um, arrow material, the structure with a lot of free space. So there's almost no hindrance of the air shooting out after this heating. And uh, this is illustrated here if you do it periodically um, in a thermodynamic manner. So you have your first state where you have not applied any uh, current. Then you have an isochronic heating by um, heating the arrow material. This heat is transferred then uh, almost immediately in uh, milliseconds uh, to the um, gas. And then we follow an adiabatic expansion. So immediately without energy transfer, uh, further energy transfer, the air 
is a kind of shooting out. And then if you switch off uh, your power, then the whole thing gets cooled down and uh, you get to the initial state again. You can see here these power pulses and this, at the same time uh, with a, a heat uh, infrared sensor, see how the temperature shoots up within milliseconds and a couple of hundred milliseconds it takes to cool down again in a periodic manner. And that works for quite a while. So here you see cycle one, here you see cycle 100,000. There's almost no change. So this explosion, air explosion can be done in a continuous uh, manner. So you see here's a number of cycles and you see the maximum temperature. It even gets a little bit better because maybe you're inside uh, burning away some material and it gets slightly more lightweight. And in this way, it gets to higher uh, temperature. So this is in this case reduced graphene oxide, but you can do it with all kinds of materials, even with carbon nanotubes, which you can fold around the tank. Okay, so here's a detailed examination. Uh, why is it working with this type of aero materials and not, for example, with aero gels? Well, the aero gel is too tight. It has too much um, um, uh, smaller structures and it has not this free volume, this large free volume. So that is, uh, this is, this is uh, um, uh, uh, therefore uh, cooling off on a much larger time scale. So almost the cooling time constant is a factor of 10 higher, as well as the heating time constant. And you can see this also if you do not etch away the zinc oxide inside of the material. If you go now to the lower view graph, I hope you can see, see my pointer. Uh, so if it's a hollow material, then you see it cools much faster than if it's filled still with the zinc oxide. It takes almost a second till it cools down here from 400 to 150 or 120 degrees. Well, if you have, uh, yeah, here's a comparison in the internal structure between an aerogel and the aero material. So our aero material, which has this uh, hierarchical structure and therefore here on the micro scale, the free volume is uh, uh, useful then for the very fast um, heating and cooling. And you can apply the whole thing now in such a manner that you place here inside of a syringe, which is filled with liquid nitrogen, this aero material. These aero materials are extremely lightweight materials. So uh, the whole thing here just has a weight of one milligram. But if you're putting now power pulses to this, you can now, and as you see here in the magnification, you can move up by the air expansion this, this syringe, this uh, uh, is, is, is moving up against gravity. And in order to place this a little bit harder, you're taking now two, two kilograms and put this on onto this one milligram material. And you see this actuator doesn't care. It's still um, pushing up uh, the piston here of the syringe and uh, moving this one uh, milligram or less is two kilograms upwards. Uh, so this is a nice actuator which can be used, it's, it's, it's very lightweight. And if you see this now in a diagram, for example, comparing it with other materials, then you see this electrical powered repeatable air explosion is advantageous in terms of strain and gravimetric power density. You can use it also for biomaterials applications. So here, this, for example, is a latex membrane, which is just uh, underneath equipped with such an aero material which will then uh, be pumped here in a manner that it's kind of moved up and down this, this membrane. However, for soft robotics, for example, could have application. You can build a lot of stuff, uh, water pumps, micro uh, uh, thrusters, and so on. Uh, from this, there are a, a lot of ideas uh, how you can employ this stuff. For example, in a micro pump, you use this here at different frequencies, like a stepper pump, to push in the air here with two check valves uh, in such a scenario to move forward some fluids. For example, for microfluidics, it can be useful. Other applications I uh, uh, um, can show you are here thrusters. They're out of the syringe. Uh, this hot air is uh, uh, peri periodically uh, moved outward. And at the end, I don't know if you can hear it, you can make also an air headphone because if you're coming with um, 
this uh, the uh, yeah heated air in a periodic manner, you have basically a loudspeaker. Yeah, uh, lots of applications uh, uh, you can do. I think I'm running here out of time. So um, um, yeah, the final one I only want to uh, present you is that you, if you have heating rates more than half a million of Kelvin, uh, finally it was uh, uh, possible for Fabian Schutt to, to blow the material up. But if you stay below um, half a million of uh, degrees per second heating rate, the material is robust. Finally, you can use this, for example, for filtering properties where you have an air filter and uh, this air filter is mounted, for example, in an aeroplane, a current spearhead we do, then you can disinfect within milliseconds. I would like to thank you all and uh, uh, especially my very active group, which is responsible for all that. And uh, I think we run out of time. So if there are questions, uh, please write me an email or if we have still a minute, then please uh, um, uh, place them now. I want to thank you very much uh, for the organizers to invite me again to this exciting conference. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Adia Lung, uh, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, well, uh, are there any questions to Professor Adia Lung? Uh, I would like to ask you, well, since your group has experience in uh, this issue, uh, well, uh, how uh, small could be the zinc oxide tetrapods? I mean, uh, can we want to reach uh, sizes, the length of tetrapods of just a few tens of nanometers? In principle, it is known that you can make also much smaller nan uh, uh, nanostructures in such a way, then you have to go up with the heat. Uh, we found this microscale quite interesting because you utilizing as a, as a template. However, if you want to make your actuators smaller, that might be a good pathway. And I remember that you have also the setup where you can do this in, in, in the CVD. So we could think, for example, together to take this smaller zinc oxide tetrapods and build then a nanoscale actuator in such a manner, or at least actuators, whatever, with the dimensions of a cubic uh, micrometer, that could be some fun because still, if you heat this up, you would gain, for example, at 400, 500 degrees, another cubic micrometer of actuation uh, uh, air volume. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Delung. Uh, and uh, well, I hope that we will uh, meet uh, soon uh, in real uh, space. And uh, we wish you good health and uh, success. And uh, of course, uh, we hope for a, uh, a fruitful uh, collaboration in the future. Uh, we, we have long standing experience in this. See you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vladimir, you had a question? Yes, I had a question, and I send this question to all. If you look now in your chat, you will see it. Thank you. Then I will answer it as it's good tradition in coffee breaks. Yes, great. <laughs> and I have also some coffee. Cheers. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, enjoy it. <laughs> In fact, it's about uh, electric properties, thermal power, and uh, uh, thermoelectric properties. Are these materials uh, perspective for eventual applications as thermoelectric materials? Because they might reveal really extreme, extreme properties in this sense. Yeah, that is very interesting. Very good question. We tried this already with some thermoelectrics, uh, but probably we hadn't the right material. So if you have a nice uh, thermoelectric, we can try to, for example, in a CVD process to coat it on the zinc oxide tetrapods and uh, getting therefore a quite good insulation um, yes. at the same time and heating it. We were not too successful in trying this, but maybe we haven't tried hard enough or didn't have the right material. So if, if uh, yeah, you have there some ideas or interest, would yeah. be happy to subsequently discuss it with you. Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rainer. Uh, in my opinion, because you have extreme um, um, properties in what concerns uh, 
uh, thermal uh, response. Uh, you made equally uh, control the uh, thermoelectric effect or, or electric properties. And in any case, whether it will be enhanced or reduced, it might be of uh, great interest for application. Yeah, thank you very much. That's no, a good no, suggestion. I am impressed by your presentation, which is at the same time inspired and inspiring. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, enjoy, please, the following uh, reports. And the first talk will be given by Academician Yonti Dinan with the title the route from microelectronics to, via nanotechnology to biomedicine, a multidisciplinary approach. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ursaki. Uh, so uh, I will tell uh, today about the development uh, of uh, microelectronics uh, uh, in the Republic of Moldova, and especially the Technical University of Moldova. Uh, our uh, uh, research fields uh, broadened and uh, via nanotechnology. Now we deal also with my, also with uh, biomedicine. Uh, and uh, so the idea to tell about these issues is related also with the fact that today we celebrated the 70th anniversary of Professor Shontia, who played a, a major role in uh, all this development. Starting from 1965, actually the Technical University of Moldova was founded in 1964. And in 1965, um, the, the Technical University uh, research in the field of microelectronics, materials and semiconductor devices started at the chair of industrial electronics. Uh, it was at that time the department of electrophysics. So uh, the first director of the uh, Technical uh, University, at that time Polytechnical Institute, uh, professor, academician, Sergio Radeltan, uh, he, 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 and also uh, the head of the chair of industrial electronics, uh, professor Vitaly Terziu, and uh, professor uh, Theodor Shishiano, who uh, returned, uh, came back from uh, St. Petersburg at uh, that time, uh, 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 Leningrad, and uh, uh, they were actually the first researchers with scientific degrees uh, 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 who promoted the field of uh, microelectronics. Uh, the uh, specialty of semiconductor devices was founded by uh, the first uh, rector Sergio Radozan in '65, and the chair of in, at the chair of industrial electronics credit uh, at uh, that time by the vice rector, Professor Vitaly Terziu. In 1968, the chair of the physics of materials and semiconductor devices was created. Uh, it was headed by Dr. Uh, Molodea. You see here uh, three persons that uh, contributed uh, a lot to the development of uh, 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 education and uh, uh, research in the fields of microelectronics and uh, semiconductor devices. Uh, so uh, here, uh, Professor Terziu, Professor Shiano, and uh, Professor Shontia. Uh, Professor Terziu uh, headed the chair from 73 to uh, 80, Professor Shiano from 1980 to 2004, and Professor Shontia from 2004 uh, until 2020. Uh, so, uh, 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 and we collaborated uh, uh, during this time uh, very close. Research directions and labora laboratories. The following research directions have been established in 65. Growth and investigation of thin films of semiconductor materials, physics, technology, and devices on the basis of three, five semiconductors. Uh, gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, indium phosphide, indium um, arsenide, and so on. The following research laboratories have been created. Laboratory for study of semiconductor thin films and uh, the laboratory for uh, the study of microelectronic devices. 
Uh, you see a picture from one of the first scientific seminars. Of course, uh, my colleagues from the Republic of Moldova recognize many uh, researchers uh, here. Uh, some of them uh, are already not uh, Magas, uh, passed away. Uh, so it, it was um, the uh, end of the uh, of, uh, 60s, beginning of 70s. Uh, and at the beginning of 70s, uh, uh, there was a visit of Nobel Prize laureates uh, to Chisinau, uh, prof uh, professors, academicians, Pasov uh, uh, and Prokhorov. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I would like to note that uh, uh, you can see uh, them here, Pasov, uh, uh, Nikolai Pasov and Alexander Prokhorov. Uh, at that time, they already have been no uh, have won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the uh, discovery, uh, invention of the first uh, laser. Uh, here you see uh, Professor Academician Radozan, uh, uh, so uh, the first rector of the Technical University. And I would like to note that uh, due to such visits, many young researchers have been uh, uh, have got the possibility to go to important research centers in the former USSR for PhD studies. You see some examples, the Professor Trofim, uh, Nikolica, Negrescu, Nisteriuk at the uh, Yofi Institute in St. Petersburg at that time, Leningrad, uh, uh, Dr. Melnik at the Safir Research Institute in Moscow. Many students have been sent for training at uh, research centers in St. Petersburg, Moscow, Leningrad, Boronia, Stalia, Riga, uh, etc. So uh, uh, a lot of research projects have been uh, uh, realized uh, uh, up to uh, uh, 1990. Uh, so you see here 19 scientific projects and contract, contracts with industrial agents have been implemented during the period uh, from 1967 uh, to 1990. Uh, so five international projects and four national projects uh, uh, from 1994 to 2009, uh, headed by Professor Shiano, and with the participation of Professor Shonta, seven international and national projects uh, have been realized uh, afterwards. Uh, well, uh, I will tell also about uh, the conferences uh, organized uh, during uh, uh, this uh, uh, time. From 1965 to 1974, 10 editions of the Scientific Technical Conference of the Kishinev Polytechnical Institute were um, organized in 1969, the Republic, Republican Workshop on Planning Experiments in Material Science. In 1979, World Union Conference on Ternary Semiconductors and Their Applications organized by Academician Radozan. In 1982, World Union Workshop on Implementing Indium Phosphide in Semiconductor Electronics, also Academician Radozan organized. From 1982 to 1996, four editions of the World Union Conference on Reliability and Degradation of Semiconductor Devices, uh, Professor Shiano, organizer. And in 1988, World Union Conference on Physics of Semiconductors, organized uh, by academician Jores Alfioro. Uh, I was the scientific secretary of that conference. It was the, uh, my first experience. Uh, in selecting um, uh, um, uh, papers for the conference uh, using uh, electronic voting. In 1989, the 14th Whole Union Conference on Acoustic Electronics and Physical Acoustics of the Solid State. And in 1990, the 8th International Conference on Ternary and Multinary Compounds was organized in uh, uh, Chisinau. Uh, the the uh, main organizer, uh, academician Professor Sergio Radozan. In my opinion, this was uh, the first uh, really international conference with many delegations from abroad. Uh, there were uh, uh, excellent experts from uh, many countries, including the United States, uh, France, uh, Great Britain, uh, also from Japan, uh, uh, a big delegation from uh, South Korea, and so on and so on. Uh, you know that after the, afterwards uh, uh, the U.S. collapsed, and of course um, uh, uh, we started the transition period. 
Uh, well, before 1990, around 100 institutes and plants working in Moldova. Uh, of course, many of them uh, at that time were involved in military programs. Uh, afterwards, we looked for new opportunities um, and, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, we started to apply uh, to international uh, funding institutions like, like INTA, CLDF, SSTCU. NATO scientific division scope uh, and um, afterwards FIP7, six FIP7, and uh, um, uh, so last year's Horizon 2020. Uh, so uh, uh, also we uh, initiated uh, in uh, at the beginning of this century uh, state programs. The first uh, state program on nanotechnology was headed by uh, uh, academician professor. Cancer, Valerio Cancer. Afterwards, um, uh, I uh, headed a, a program in nanotechnology. And uh, of course, the, uh, the idea at that time was to create capacities uh, here in Moldova in uh, this field. Uh, so, uh, uh, conferences that uh, have been organized. Um, uh, at the Technical University of Moldova from 1992 to 2017, nine editions of the International Conference on Microelectronics and Computer Science. Uh, you see some pictures uh, from uh, 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 different conferences organized, and uh, Professor Shonta mentioned uh, these uh, conferences uh, uh, this morning. Uh, you see pictures from one of these conferences uh, organized in 2002. I uh, just would like to note that uh, at that time I was vice rector at the Technical University, uh, and uh, we started a very close uh, and fruitful collaboration with Professor Shontia. And this conference we organized uh, together, and uh, we opened uh, many new bridges of collaboration. Here you see. Uh, professors from uh, many countries and actually many uh, universities, research centers. Here, Professor Hartnagel, um, uh, you, you can see here. Uh, so, uh, Professor Helmut Fjol from uh, uh, Kiel University. Nowadays, uh, the research in this field at Kiel University continues, uh, uh, Professor Rainer Adelung. Uh, uh, you see here many uh, researchers, uh, he also a professor for me, academician uh, Simashkevich. Uh, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, some of our colleague, colleagues uh, uh, already are not uh, uh, among us. Uh, and uh, uh, he also the director of uh, the Elite Research Institute, uh, prof, uh, Dr. Uh, Badinter. Um, and uh, uh, you see also some picture from that conference. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the, uh, the, this conference was actually the starting point of many events that uh, we organized in close collaboration, and we succeeded to attract many researchers from many countries of, of the world. Uh, so uh, from 2006 uh, till 2018, uh, the six editions of uh, another conference of, of the Technical University, International Conference on Telecommunications, Electronics, and Informatics. Um, uh, so, uh, the professors uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the Faculty of uh, uh, Electronics and uh, Telecommunications, uh, they were very active, and uh, I would like to note that uh, 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 in parallel, some time, we had uh, uh, two conferences on uh, uh, microelectronics and computer science and on uh, telecommunication, electronics and informatics. With the time, we had a discussion and the idea was to join some conferences because Moldova is small. And um, uh, so uh, uh, you see here uh, information that uh, uh, the International Conference of Microelectronics and Computer Science and uh, on telecommunication, electronics, and informatics joined, and uh, uh, they continued as International Conference on Electronics, Communication, and Computing. And uh, just uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, so the 
Uh, an edition of this conference was organized very successfully by uh, two departments of the Technical University, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Dumitru Ciorba was uh, this morning with us uh, at the opening uh, session, and uh, well, uh, we uh, thanked uh, him for the uh, organization of, uh, of the edition from 2021. Uh, so, a uh, uh, conference that uh, is uh, uh, important and visible on the international level is the uh, International Conference on Material Science and Condensed Metaphysics, initiated in 2000 by uh, academician Professor uh, Valerio Kanzer and academician Professor uh, Leonid Kuliuk. Uh, so, uh, uh, this year, uh, the conference uh, uh, was uh, cancelled and uh, actually not cancelled but postponed. And uh, Professor Kuluk told that uh, uh, so they are doing their best to organize this conference in September next year. Well, uh, and uh, we now uh, are in the year of 2011. And uh, I uh, would like to uh, note that uh, by that time, uh, we were already uh, 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 well uh, undertook many initiatives uh, related to uh, education in uh, in the field of uh, nanotechnologies. Uh, we had uh, an important uh, project at the Technical University Moldiera, uh, and uh, uh, this project allowed us to organize training of many many students from the Technical University and not only from the Technical University, because the efforts uh, uh, were actually at the national level uh, in the field of nanotechnology. Uh, uh, and in uh, July, at the beginning of July 2011, we organized the first international conference on nanotechnology and biomedical uh, engineering. Uh, so uh, uh, you uh, see that uh, at the Technical University, we had specialties of on microelectronics and nanotechnologies, uh, and also due to the efforts of uh, Professor Shonte, the specialty of biomedical engineering. And of course, it was the right time uh, to start um, uh, serious in the research at the intersection of uh, nanotechnologies and uh, biomedical engineering. The uh, conference in 2011 was a success. We had uh, uh, experts from many countries of the world. Uh, this morning I mentioned this. And uh, uh, so uh, with the time, we organized uh, uh, several editions. This is uh, the fifth edition. Uh, Professor Shonta uh, from uh, 1987 uh, 2004, uh, to 2004 was the dean of the faculty. Uh, from 2004 to 2020, head of the Department of Microelectronics and Biomedical Engineering. From 2008, he, he is the director of the International Center for Microelectronics uh, System Engineering and Biomedical Devices. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, at the beginning of this century, I was vice rector of the Technical University. And uh, in 2001, um, uh, after I uh, returned back from the University of Michigan in the United States, I uh, uh, created at, uh, at the University the center, National Center for Material Study and Testing. And we started to organize many events together. Uh, here you see the creation of the National Center uh, dealing with na nanotechnologies and nanomaterials. This was uh, actually a very dynamic time because uh, you know that at the beginning of the century, the new nanotechnology initiative uh, uh, was uh, um, uh, funded in the United States, uh, 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 launched by uh, President Clinton. Actually, at that time, I was in the United States and I came, came back uh, to Moldova um, with uh, well, the, the idea and uh, uh, initiated the create, uh, creation of uh, the National Center for Material Study and Testing. I would like also to note that an important role in uh, the, the promotion of uh, the field of uh, nanotechnologies for biomedical uh, investigations, this is important because nanotechnologies uh, has been developed uh, with the time also at many research institutes, including the uh, Institute of Applied Physics, Institute of Electronic Engineering and Nanotechnologies, uh, State University, and so on. But uh, 
uh, if we speak about uh, uh, promotion of nanotechnologies for biomedical investigations, uh, for biomedical um, uh, applications, then uh, the um, number of institutions is uh, relatively uh, small. And Yelili was among the strong uh, institutions at that time. Uh, the, they succeeded to integrate uh, a million of nanowires uh, in a glass microfiber. Uh, so, so afterwards, uh, they developed uh, uh, different uh, 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 so, uh, devices uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for biomedical applications. Actually, the destiny of this institute is not good because uh, uh, there was a privatization of the institute and uh, the number of uh, researchers um, uh, de decreased sh sharply. Uh, now they continue as 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 a um, uh, uh, small uh, uh, small uh, uh, enterprise uh, try to survive, but in my opinion, uh, this was a mistake of the people uh, who were in power at that time because the institute had uh, uh, eighty international patterns, and uh, in my opinion. Uh, uh, they deserved to, to get uh, proper support and uh, to develop the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, research uh, that they succeeded uh, for a long time. Um, now uh, I come back to the International Conference on Nanotechnologies and Biomedical Engineering. Uh, now we have the fifth edition. Here you see uh, pictures from the first editions and actually this is from 2011. Uh, at that time, uh, the, uh, the conference was organized at uh, the uh, uh, medical university. Uh, well, all the conferences are organized in close collaboration with the University of Medicine and Pharmacy of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, it doesn't matter where actually we organized uh, this conference at uh, the University of Medicine or uh, uh, at the Technical University or in other places like you see here. Uh, uh, the important issue uh, was that we succeeded to attract uh, the experts from many, many countries and actually the experts in both nanotechnologies and biomedical engineering. And this actually allowed us also to give an impetus to research in uh, this field at the intersection of um, nanotechnologies and biomedical engineering uh, and succeeded to uh, win uh, important grants. Uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, I mentioned Moldera uh, 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 grant. Well, uh, at, at that time, half a million of euro, it was an important. A grant uh, now at uh, the intersection of these two uh, uh, fields, uh, we have another grant, uh, and, uh, and uh, I will mention later uh, Nano Med Twin, uh, where we uh, collaborate with many uh, institutions, research center, uh, uh, centers in the field of nanotechnologies and uh, biomedical uh, engineering. Well, you see here uh, Professor Shonta, you see here Professor Mimura. Uh, professor uh, uh, Professor Hartnagel, well, uh, this time he cannot attend. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Professor uh, uh, Valero Cancer uh, passed away. Uh, well, uh, you see also others, uh, uh, other pictures. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, especially researchers from the Republic of Moldova, of course, recognize uh, he experts from. Uh, uh, the, the fields of uh, electronics, uh, nanotechnologies, uh, uh, medicine, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you see academician Mr. Baloga, uh, well, uh, he was uh, this morning uh, uh, online, so uh, I would like to take this opportunity to greet him, uh, being sure that he is online. Well, and uh, uh, now I would like to tell also about uh, research at the intersection of nanotechnologies and biomedicine. So, uh, um, well, uh, uh, I have no time to cover all aspects, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, taking into account that uh, this year, uh, 
the National Center for Material Study and Test, uh, Testing. Uh, so uh, we celebrate 20 years uh, from the creation. That means uh, today we have a lot of, uh, of uh, celebrations, let's say. And uh, I uh, would like to take the opportunity to tell about uh, the um, investigations that we realized at uh, this uh, center, uh, the center affiliated to the Technical University of Moldova. Uh, you see some pictures. Actually, uh, the important issue is that the, uh, uh, the equipment that we have was purchased um, uh, under financial support from uh, European and US uh, uh, grants. The first grant was uh, when I returned back to, from the United States. And after that, we applied to the framework programs, to other funding institutions, and step by step, we uh, purchased equipment and started uh, research in the field of nanotechnologies. And with that time, also uh, in, at the intersection of nanotechnologies and biomedical engineering, uh, so I can tell you that uh, we have eight uh, uh, PhD that uh, did their research at uh, this center. Uh, besides, we have also uh, a PhD that used the equipment uh, of, of the center uh, and uh, succeeded to the defend their thesis. But these uh, eight uh, uh, young PhD all uh, defended using the equipment of the center. And now we have two, uh, uh, two PhDs, Irina Pleshko and Vlad Chobano, so our partners know both of them, uh, will defend soon the thesis. That means uh, we can tell that uh, we have 10 um, uh, researchers that uh, uh, realized the uh, uh, PhD work at the center using the equipment of the center. Some achievements at the National Center for Material Study and Testing, uh, I will uh, just tell in brief because uh, a lot of, of course, uh, uh, different uh, kind of investigations uh, because we studied many materials, but uh, the most important materials uh, were uh, research was related to gallium nitride. Um, so when the, let's say gallium nitride and related materials. Uh, because uh, now we deal also with uh, 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 gallium-203, for instance, uh, we consider that is a related material, I will tell you why. Uh, well, uh, we'll also in gallium nitride membranes about hollow gallium nitride nanoparticles for biomedical applications. I will tell about iragalonite. I will tell about, in brief, uh, light drive and fluorescent micro nano engines, and also will mention aerogallox. Surface size lithography, this was our first development. Uh, for this development, uh, we got uh, 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 a world of excellence um, uh, in Pittsburgh in the United States uh, in, uh, at an international uh, exhibition. Actually, the idea is very simple. Uh, direct writing of negative charge uh, using uh, an uh, ion beam and uh, with subsequent photoelectrochemical etching. So uh, very simple. Um, uh, afterwards, you get uh, nanostructures, you get uh, nanomembranes, uh, and you see the idea. So, so we just use uh, uh, ion beam uh, irradiation, where we use higher dose, we get some nanocolors or nano walls. Where we use low dose, we get nanomembrane, and uh, the, uh, of course, after uh, electro photoelectrochemical etching. Why? Because we induce negative charge. Negative charge shields the material against photoelectrochemical etching. Where we have negative charge, there will be no etching. The idea is very simple, transparent, and actually, you see here an example where we uh, got uh, a membrane with the thickness of about 15 nanometers. Uh, uh, for physical support, we created uh, micro walls, nano walls, and so on. You see from uh, uh, different angles uh, uh, this uh, membrane. Uh, you see the resonance, that means we were hi highlighted by nanotech web work at the time, and also the uh, uh, physical status, all the research letters uh, uh, highlighted on the cover. 
we succeeded with the time also to produce by using direct writing and photoelectrochemical etching of all 13 photonic crystals for the first time, but on gallium nitride, you see uh, uh, these photonic crystals, uh, different uh, structures. Uh, so completely controlled, completely controlled, you can produce in a controlled fashion some defects like you see here. Uh, so, uh, and uh, now I will uh, tell you about memristic devices based on gallium nitride nanomembranes uh, and their habituation to a stimulus. Uh, these uh, uh, experiments have been uh, realized in collaboration with the Institute of Microtechnologies in Bucharest, uh, Professor Dragoman. And uh, uh, well, uh, you see here a number of uh, membranes. Uh, also, uh, they are single crystalline. This is also important. Uh, and uh, you see the uh, memristic behavior, uh, usual memristic behavior. It's uh, important to note that a single gallium nitride membrane can support currents as high as 60 milliampere at 9 volts, and thus a power higher than half a watt. That means a uh, power of 50, 540 milliwatts with no sign of failure. Taking into account that the thickness of the membrane is just uh, 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 15 nanometers, that uh, shows that gallium nitride is a, a very uh, uh, hard material that means uh, can support uh, higher currents. Membrista habituation to a stimulus. Uh, well, uh, here we demonstrated that uh, in case we use a single memorista, uh, then uh, you see uh, well how the uh, current, uh, the current with the time uh, uh, reaches the steady state, uh, steady state uh, uh, after uh, applying uh, several voltage uh, uh, pulses. Uh, but in case we, I would like just to, yeah. Here, uh, a single memorist, and here we have uh, uh, several memoristers. And in this case, you see that uh, we reach a very fast habituation to the, to, to, to the stimulus. Uh, well, uh, we published in general applied physics, uh, there was uh, also a resonance to this, uh, uh, to this result. And now I will uh, tell about gallium nitride zinc oxide nanoparticles for biomedical applications. Actually, the approach uh, is uh, simple. Uh, gallium nitride deposited on zinc oxide nanoparticles and uh, uh, simultaneously we uh, remove uh, zinc oxide. Uh, uh, so, and uh, as a result, uh, we get uh, hollow gallium nitride nanoparticles. This uh, research was uh, in, in collaboration with the medical school in uh, Hanover Medical School in Germany and State University of uh, Moldova. Uh, here you see the nanoparticles, uh, you see the, uh, the, uh, the dimensions of these nanoparticles. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, we studied uh, with the uh, experts at the Medical uh, University in Hanover, uh, the behavior of uh, uh, living cells when we have uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, culture. Uh, and uh, actually, we demonstrated for the first time that gallium nitride nanoparticles are biocompatible. This was an important finding. Uh, and uh, actually, you see here the behavior of uh, the cells without nanoparticles, with the nanoparticles. The difference is actually when we have nanoparticles, then uh, the, uh, the living cells uh, leaving uh, cells attract the nanoparticles. You see this process. And to be the time, actually, uh, the interesting issue is that we found uh, nanoparticles inside the cell, in vesicles. Uh, this was a, uh, an important finding. Uh, and after that, we decided to uh, use uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon that means uh, the fact that nanoparticles. Uh, penetrate into living cells and uh, they are in vesicles inside the cells. Uh, well, to uh, 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 
uh, give these nanoparticles magnetic properties by doping and uh, to try to, uh, uh, to use magnetic field uh, to, uh, uh, to guide the uh, uh, cells. Uh, you see different distributions of the magnetic field and uh, you see the results. Uh, when, uh, when you have a distribution uh, uh, uniform and when uh, you have uh, uh, cells uh, marked by nanoparticles, uh, you, you see that in magnetic field, you can uh, guide the nanopart the cells, you can force them, uh, for instance, to align along uh, such a, a circle. All these results have been published. Now I will uh, tell about gallium nitride zinc oxide three-dimensional micro-nano micro architectures. Actually, uh, uh, the idea to uh, uh, prepare such kind of structures uh, uh, we discussed many years ago, probably in 2013, uh, with the Rainer Radia Lung uh, at a conference. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it took many years actually to demonstrate many issues. Uh, this is in collaboration with Chill University, uh, with the uh, um, uh, University of Trento in Italy. Uh, there, was, there was a good collaboration with the university in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, State University. And actually we had medical institutions because uh, now we also uh, 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 try to implement uh, this uh, structure. Uh, Aerogalnite is the first artificial material with dual hydrophobic hydrophilic uh, properties. Uh, this was highlighted by uh, Physics World and actually they uh, demonstrated this schematically in a very convincing way. You see uh, uh, here hydrophobic wetting, here hydrophilic diverting. That means you would like to take the material from the surface of the water and uh, the surface doesn't allow you. You see a column of water. Actually, uh, you can see this uh, in real life. You uh, use a charge stick to attract the sample. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, so a column of water appears. You see, well, sorry. Uh, I, I would like to show you for 15 times, uh, uh, yeah, slower. You, you will see the formation of a column of water underneath. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, this is the so-called uh, hydrophilic debating. Uh, well, uh, in nature, uh, there are uh, similar phenomena. You know, rose effect, rose effect actually, the uh, rose uh, petals are hydrophobic, as you can see here, uh, the droplets of water. But at the same time, uh, you see that uh, the droplets do not fall from the petals. Uh, and uh, this is uh, because uh, you have a uh, hydrophilic debating, that means the petals attract the water in this case. It depends upon the situation. And uh, well, uh, uh, we observe many, uh, uh, phenomena in the real life, I will not tell about them, but I will tell that all these behaviors are related to the fact that in case of uh, hollow um, uh, tetrapods of gallium nitride, uh, so inside we have a very thin layer of uh, zinc oxide, just a few nanometers. Uh, so the situation is the following, we have the arms hydrophobic, and the uh, ends of arms, free ends of arms, hydrophilic. Why? Because in, in this case, we have the polar uh, uh, planes. Polar planes attract water molecules. Therefore, here we have hydrophilicity, while uh, in the central part, hydrophobicity. And this uh, uh, results in many interesting behaviors. We succeeded to create floating carpets, just using here one floating, uh, one the water, one floating uh, tetrapod here, uh, many tetrapods, uh, by uh, approaching them uh, to each other, we succeeded to create uh, floating uh, carpets. We can uh, 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 use these carpets uh, to, um, uh, uh, to have car cargo effect in the sense that um, they can uh, transport water uh, droplets and so on. We also demonstrated that these carpets um, uh, exhibit the self-healing uh, properties. That means in case you are um, too uh, 
much to much liquid on on the carpet. Then uh, you uh, reach the threshold. Uh, hole will appear. Some liquid, uh, colored liquid, will uh, uh, get out. And afterwards, uh, the self healing and uh, other floating. Uh, I, here you will see a very interesting phenomenon. That means flexibility of the membrane which had been prepared. You will see here we have communicating vessels. We add liquid to the second vessel, and you will see how it changes its shape the, because underneath we have water. Uh, and the, actually, it's a highly flex, flexible membrane. On the, the membrane, we also have a, a, a droplet of colored water. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's flexible, but in case you will uh, add too uh, much uh, liquid to the second uh, uh, arm of communicating vessels, that uh, the, the membrane will crash. Like you see here, you get uh, go back, uh, so uh, self-healing, again, you uh, so, uh, uh, add liquid, uh, uh, again, the threshold reached and crash. But you see crash in different uh, sites, which means that we have uh, self-healing. Uh, these are just uh, results uh, got uh, over the last months. Rotating li liquid marbles. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I will tell just in brief about uh, uh, you have here schematic view and you have here real view. Uh, well, uh, uh, they are, uh, you can press between two glass uh, glasses. Uh, in case of consolidated liquid marble, you see that uh, it is very stable. What means consolidated? You have a droplet inside, uh, in, uh, 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 so uh, 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 covered by uh, uh, iron-galnite uh, tetrapods, and you leave them uh, some liquid to, to evaporate, and the, the uh, interpenetration between tetrapods increases and you have a more stable uh, liquid marble. You see a rotation. Uh, I told uh, earlier about uh, rotated liquid marbles. We add some uh, alcohol to the drop inside the, 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 uh, uh, inside the, the gallium uh, aerogalnite tetrapods. And you see here that uh, uh, due to the uh, the gradient uh, of the surface tension because alcohol evapor evaporates, uh, the uh, uh, cell membrane that covers the liquid uh, droplet is uh, highly porous. And uh, due to the uh, gradient of uh, the surface tension, it rotates. What uh, we actually reached very high uh, speed of rotations up to um, uh, 750 rotations per minute, here you see per second. And also the new phenomenon that we just recently observed is, uh, uh, is uh, the rotation in pulse. Uh, it was a very spectacular phenomenon, and we explained this due to helicopter effect. We published uh, recently these results. That means some arms of the tetrapods play the role of helicopter wave. And therefore, we have uh, as a result a uh, leaf force and we have pulse rotation, you see the, uh, the, when the, the, uh, uh, the marble would like to leave from the water surface due to the formation of many uh, columns of water, it uh, drops back to the water. Uh, you see the, uh, how it uh, uh, changed the speed of rotation with the time for two liquid marbles with uh, different weights. And applications, just will mention without any explanations because the time is off. Shielding in X band and terahertz region with aerogallium nitride, this is the result of an international collaboration with traditional partners and also with a, a partner from uh, 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 Moscow, uh, uh, so Professor Gorshunov uh, from, uh, well, uh, from the Institute of uh, Physics and Technology in, uh, in Moscow. Shielding, shielding in X band with aerogallium nitride and shielding in uh, terahertz region. Light drive and fluorescent micro nano engines, uh, again, uh, collaboration with the uh, uh, traditional partners, and he also including uh, uh, so, um, uh, Max Planck Institute uh, 
for solid state research in Stuttgart and also um, uh, so uh, in uh, Dresden uh, Institute and uh, uh, well uh, I would like to note that uh, here also the research uh, center where Professor Fomin um, uh, works. Uh, you see that uh, the structures that we got here are very interesting because we have a lot of uh, nanowires uh, inside these uh, structures and uh, uh, moreover uh, on the top we have uh, 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 so uh, metal uh, metal drops what you see here is uh, 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 fluorescent micro engines that uh, move uh, under ultraviolet uh, illumination well, you see one uh, smaller micro engine one larger micro engine published in small uh, last year, the, the results have been published. And the last issue, Aero Gallium, do, uh, Gallium 203, uh, well, uh, uh, published recently, uh, highly porous and ultra lightweight Aero Gallium 203, enhancement of photocatalytic activity by noble metals. And also uh, uh, this material, Aero Gallium 203, is uh, uh, transparent from microwaves to terahertz uh, region uh, and it's an important material for Internet of Things application. Nanomed twin project that is running and you see here the uh, uh, our partners. Uh, we have uh, now possibility to send students uh, for a long time to uh, partner institutions. Knowledge moves the world. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So yes, my name is Aprobadev. I work in Angstrom Laboratory in Uppsala University in Sweden. And I'm also affiliated with KTH Well Institute of Technology. So the topic I'm going to present today, it's about nanoscale extracellular vesicles. It's a tiny nanoparticles released by cells in our body and the opportunities they bring for different diagnostics and therapeutics, as well as challenges that exist in the field. So let me give a brief introduction of what are these extracellular vesicles or EVs in short. Uh, cells in our body have a, a, a very interesting capacity to, to form different mic nano to micro size vesicles, and then they are released in extracellular space. These uh, particles are then traveled through our body fluids, such as blood, uh, urine, and other body fluids and then they can reach a distant cell or neighboring cells. Now cells can do it in different ways. For example, here, uh, here you can see one source cell and the cell membrane can bud outwards and then they release some sort of vesicles which are called microvesicles. Typically they have size range between 50 and 1000 nanometer. But endosomes within the cell can also diffuse towards the cell membrane, and then they can release some vesicles that are inside the endosomes. These are called extra uh, uh, exosomes, um, uh, which are a smaller particle between 30 and 200 nanometers. Uh, other than that, the cells, when they die, or where uh, I mean the apoptos apoptosis happens, they can also release some particles. Uh, these are called uh, apoptotic bodies, which are typically larger than uh, 1,000 nanometers. Now, depending on which cell these vesicles are coming, they contain a wide variety of different biomolecules, such as proteins, RNAs, and lipids. And they, they, they may contain some common biomarkers or common biomolecules, irrespective of which cells they are coming from, or they can also have some specific cell-specific markers. Now here is a short uh, snap, snapshot of different bio, uh, particles released by cells. In the lower end, what we have is exomeres. They are, between, they are less than 50 nanometer in dimensions, and they are released by cell by a process called exocytosis. And they are non-membranous particles. They do not have membranes. Rest of the three categories, like exosomes, which are between 30 and one, 150 nanometer, they have a lipid bilayer, and they are also released by exocytosis, basically from these endosomes, which, uh, uh, which then march to, to the cell membrane and release these vesicles. 
And the next category is microvesicles, which I have already uh, described. They are uh, basically from budding of cell membranes. And the last one, the larger particles are apoptotic bodies. Now, depending on how they are originated, they may contain different uh, types of molecules from the cells. For example, these exosomes, they are most interesting in, in the field because they come from inside the cell, which means that they contain a snapshot of what is happening inside the cell. Now, why are these particles so interesting? Well, because uh, as I said, they contain a, a physiological uh, mirror of the cell, of their parental cell. And also since they travel and uh, then merge with a recipient cell, releasing their cargo, they can reprogram a recipient cell. So they take part in a highly sophisticated intercellular communication. And most interesting part about these, these tiny nanoparticles are that they're immune tolerant. So that means they can, they can live in circulation for sufficiently long time so that they can be captured and analyzed. And also they can easily cross biological barriers such as blood barriers, and they can even reach brain, for example. And as a consequence, they take part in a wide variety of uh, processes. For example, the, this, this particle can, can activate immune system or they can also suppress some immune activity. They can reprogram cells. They can also, they also take, take part in tumor metastasis or neurodegenerative disease, as well as development and regeneration of tissues. And recently it has been observed that virus can live inside these uh, particles. And that's, that's how they can evade uh, immune response. And these uh, nanoparticles have also been found um, in, in wound healing and inflammation kind of uh, stuff. Now, that means that this particle uh, gives us an enormous opportunity to use them as a diagnostic marker. Basically, if we can analyze these particles in terms of their protein and uh, nucleic acid content, we can see what is happening in their parental cell as well as this particle can be taken out from the body and reprogrammed. That means some new particles can be, new molecules can be, in, uh, can be put inside these vesicles and then put back in the body to target some disease cell, for example. And in this way, they can, they can work as a therapeutic agent or vehicles. Now, how are we going to analyze these EVs? Well, in the field, there are two ways we can do that. One is to look at the whole EVs and whole nanoparticles. In this case, we can ask questions like, what is their density and how this density is affected by certain disease or the membrane protein profiles. This particle contains a wide variety of membrane protein and how this profile changes depending on some disease. The size and concentration can also vary as well as some disease can, can, be, can modify their mechanical properties such as uh, their flexibility. Lipids is another interesting parameter that can be studied in these nanoparticles. Another aspect of this, uh, these nanoparticles are what are the what, what are the inside of this nanoparticle, what remains there. In that case, we can analyze the total protein content or RNA or genetic materials as well as lipid profiles. Now, my research typically is mostly surrounding the analysis of this whole nanoparticle. And in this case, we do basically uh, by using two approaches. One is the ensemble approach, where we study how the average properties of this nanoparticle changes. For example, we can take thousands of tons of these particles and try to measure their membrane protein profiles and see if there is any change depending on some physiological or pathological conditions. We can also do at a single particle level that I shall discuss later on. The method that I'm going to first introduce, it's, it's called electrokinetic sensing. Well, it's typically a microfluidic based sensors, a microchannel, hollow microchannel made of silicon dioxide. Uh, the inside material is silicon dioxide. So the way we fabricate these microchannels are basically by uh, standard clean room process. A, what you see here is a four inch silicon wafer where different or uh, the, the microchannels are fabricated by lithography and then uh, aging procedures. So here's a 
small chip that uh, were taken from here. So you can see the inlet and outlet port and three parallel channels. Typically, the dimensions are around 15 to 20 micrometers. And then these chips can be, uh, can be put in a uh, home-built setup where we can uh, connect a standard inlet and outlet port to flow liquid through it. All right. So how this sensor works? Uh, as we all know, that solid liquid interface can be described by the formation of electric double layer. Basically, solid surface, when it comes in contact with liquid, such as electrolyte, they can assume some surface charge depending, the, depending on their isoelectric point. And that, in return, will drag some uh, counter ions from the electrolyte, forming what is called a diffused uh, double layer. And rest of the solution, rest of the part of this uh, um, uh, liquid will remain electrically neutral. Now, what happens is that if the liquid is pumped by a mechanical system, then this diffused part of the ions can, can be dragged along by the, the, the viscous drag of the liquid. And what happens is that they create a charge separation along the flow direction. So it's, it works something like a battery. So since the charge separation works, uh, happens at the interface, if you measure the potential, you'll see a potential which is proportional to the applied pressure. And the same way, if the, the channel are externally connected, the same phenomena will drive a current through it, typically in the order of few uh, tens of picoamps. So this is called a streaming current. Now, what is known about this streaming current is that this current is extremely sensitive to what is lying on the surface. That means if some biomolecules are attached to the surface, they change the local electrostatics. As a result, they also influence the current that is flown by this phenomenon. Now, for developing a sensor, what we do is that we functionalize this surface to immobilize certain receptors that can target or specifically bind to a target. And then we flow my, our sample to it, uh, which then bind, the target molecule then bind to the surface. As a result, it changes the streaming current. Now, since the, the, the amount of current is a function of the surface coverage, or the more molecule that binds to the surface, it shows a surface coverage dependent or time dependent signal. So here is a typical example. It's a detection of avid in a protein molecule, uh, just to show you how it, does it work. So we first let the buffer in, and then when the sample arrives, uh, the system shows a clear signal, and the signal is, of course, dependent on the concentration of the material that is in the, in the, in the buffer. Now, depending on how, what you functionalize on the surface, what kind of antibodies or, uh, or receptor molecules are functionalized on the surface, you can detect different molecules. For example, here, uh, one, one uh, uh, results are shown that where we detected three different proteins like Baroness, Avidin, and human IgG, and so on. Now, one interesting aspect of this sensing is that it is very sensitive to the charge contrast. When I say charge contrast, what I mean is a charge between the surface and the target. Now, if the charge contrast increases, the signal increases which is not very difficult to understand why, because the charge contrast actually gives rise to the current we see here. And these charge contrasts can be modified in different ways to optimize the sensitivity of this device. For example, so we can, for a given target, let's say if my target is highly positively charged at the buffer uh, pH, we can modify the surface to make it highly negative or vice versa. So how do you do it? We select material, different polymer materials are available. For example, poly L lysine. This lysine is a very positive material, positively charged material at uh, pH 7. So when you take silicon oxide surface, which is highly negative, this poly lysine can electrostatically stick to the surface, forming a very nice and thin layer on top of it. And this lysine uh, can be modified with PEG and biotin as a linker molecule. Now, in this, uh, in this plot, what you see is the zeta potential of the surface after different modification. So when you have aptis and glutaraldehyde, it has a very negative uh, surface. 
Whereas we have, when we modified with PPB, that means poly L lysine, take biotin, along with, ab, along with streptavidin, which is also a slightly negative molecule, it slightly improves. The positive charge of lysine increase, decreases the negative charge of silicon oxide. Uh, at the same time, I mean, in, in the next phase, when we had avidin attached to the biotin molecule, it becomes even less uh, negative. So now when we uh, detect a target, in this case, the target was uh, the extracellular vesicles, which are slightly negative in charge. We see for the actase, it has the lowest signal, but for the same kind of surface coverage, the signal increases where the charge contrast increases. The second way how this charge contrast can be modified is by modifying the antibody itself. So antibodies, we can conjugate with DNA, and we all know DNA have this phosphate backbone, which is very negatively charged. And depending on how long DNA strand is connected to it, it then assumes different amount of negative charge. So here is an example where a, a, a target uh, particle, in this case, the extracellular vesicle, can be detected from a secondary antibody, which is again conjugated with DNA to have different charge effect. Here is the result. So in this case, the, the target was a Herceptin molecule, and Z was the capture probe, which was functionalized on the surface. When we detected the Herceptin without any DNA conjugated to Z, we see one amount of signal. But then when the, 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 the DNA is attached from five bases to 15 bases and 30 bases, we see a prospective increase in the signal. For the five cases, we see a slight decrease because when DNA is conjugated, it slightly modifies the affinity. But as the length increases, you can overcome that deficiency and then actually give a very strong signal. Now let's move to the EVs, which is the topic of my talk today. Now, how are we going to analyze these EVs? So first we have to understand how we collect these EVs. As you have already uh, seen, that cell releases a wide variety of these biological particles. And they have difference in size, but they have also overlap in their size. Now, in my research, I'll basically focus on two different aspects. Uh, one is uh, two different types of vesicles, one collected from cells. So these are sort of simulated uh, vesicles. You can say these are collected from cells in laboratory conditions. And in another case, we collect these vesicles or particles from human bodies. So once they are collected, they are isolated by what is called size exclusion chromatography. You can think of like a filters where size-based isolation is done. And then we do some basic characterization like their size distribution, diameter, and so on, as well as their molecular characterizations using standard techniques such as Western blot or proximity extension assay, which is a uh, fluorescence-based detection. And then we apply that one in our sensors to analyze the surface marker profile. So here is a short movie just to show you. Uh, so what you see here is a scattering from these tiny nanoparticles. And you can also see some random movement of this particle that is basically giving the diffusion of these particles. And from this diffusion, you can estimate the size. And here you see a typical uh, size profiles when you collect it from cell lines. So they have a, a dominant peak around 100 nanometer, and then there are some peaks at larger dimensions. We can also do it by standard microscopy technique. This is an ACM uh, taken from these vesicles. You can see very small size as well as uh, very large uh, size particles. And then we put them in our sensors, which is these channels we talked about. And the sensors are, before uh, putting the sample, they are modified with the uh, specific capture probe. In this case, we are targeting three different uh, surface proteins of these vesicles called CD9, CD6 to 3, and EGFR. These are three different proteins. And for these three different proteins, we mod modify the surface with three different antibodies, and then we can see the relative abundance of different markers. But since our interest is to understand how much variation is there for a given marker in terms of their expression level, which means their relative abundance, so you also tested this, uh, this possibility by artificially modifying the expression level, that means the protein amount in vesicles, by uh, making some biological um, treatment to the cells, such as RNA infection. So what you see here is that for 
a protein called EGFR, where we knock down the protein level in those vesicles, our sensor do respond in a weaker signal compared to uh, the, the, the normal, uh, normally or highly expressed vesicles. Uh, but what about the sensitivity and detection time and record amount of sample? Well, uh, as we have shown in recent publication, the sensitivity is rather low. Typically, we can detect uh, about 10 to the 6 particle per ml, which is uh, about, uh, if I remember correctly, some tens of femtomolar. Uh, and then it takes about two hours for the whole process. And we only need 20 microliter of sample for this analysis. Now, what clinical application we can think of this, uh, uh, this method? Well, one application that we are currently doing, it's, uh, it's helping clinicians to take a decision on targeted cancer therapy. So as you know, that uh, targeted therapies such as immunotherapy, et cetera, they have changed the landscape of cancer diagnosis and therapy and have increased the positive outcome. But often it is seen that the patient which were responding to a therapy, after some time, they do not respond. So that, that means they become resistant to the given therapy. And normally, doctor has to take a biopsy from the tumor to analyze and see how the tumor is progressing with the given treatment, which is a very painful process and it cannot be done uh, so repeatedly. So in our method, what we do is that instead of collecting tumor material, we collect this exosome derived from this tumor uh, and then analyze the protein content. And then we analyze with our microchip and give uh, the, 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 um, uh, the analytical results to the clinician to take a decision whether to change the therapy course or to continue with that one. So this is a, a preliminary study done on um, laboratory settings from a cell, cell lines, where the cells were given two different treatment. One is a lotinib, which is a target therapy for lung cancer. And another is a drug called osimartinib, uh, again, for lung cancer. And it, we can see that for this particular case, that the, the cell were quite uh, surviving with a lot in it, but their amount significantly dropped with osimartinib. This actually shows the amount of sample, like five micromolar, 0.1 micromolar, and so on. When compared to a lot in it, a lot less material is needed, a lot less dose is needed for osimartinib to have an effect. And accordingly, we see some interesting pattern when you analyze the protein markers from the vesicle taken from these cells. What you see in untreated sample, the amount of CD9, EGFR, and PDL1, these are three different surface proteins of interest, they had quite strong abundance. With a lot in it, it's slightly reduced, but with osimartinib, they have significantly dropped, meaning that osimartinib is a better drug for this condition. And then we also analyze in a cancer cohort, so P010 to P017. These are different patients, different cancer patients. So we took the, these vesicles from these patients, from their pleural, uh, from their body fluids, and then analyze the marker. What we see in this case, this patient P010, this patient had very high level of EGFR and PDL1. And clinical studies showed that these patients were not responding to this drug, the EGFR TKI is a, is a treatment given to him. On the other hand, the patient, this one, this one, and this one, they are all responding and their level of the, of the markers uh, in their exosomes were rather low. We also did a, a time dependent studies, for example, P002, this patient initially were responding to this uh, treatment, but after some time, when we took sample again from this patient, we saw that the level has significantly increased. And clinical data also shows that, that the patient became refractory or uh, not responding to the treatment. So no, now we are going for a clinical studies on this sample. But the main challenge in this field are that EVs are extremely heterogeneous, as you might already understand that when they come in the body fluid, they are a complete mixture of many different vesicles coming from different cells and different uh, pathological conditions and so on. That means this average analysis, what I have just shown, is often not uh, good enough. So, and uh, I have already mentioned how differently these uh, properties of EVs can change depending on their root of biogenesis, 
I mean, how they are formed in the cell, their cellular source and pathological condition. And in order to find a very accurate description of what is happening in the parental cell, one need to study many different parameters with a single uh, particle resolution, like size, their concentration, the protein expression, the genetic content, lipid uh, material, and so on. And it is a really, really difficult uh, job to do, given that they're extremely small. But recently, we have developed a platform which are able to analyze at least three parameters, so that their size, the protein expression, and, and, um, and their mechanical properties uh, simultaneously. This platform uh, is basically an inverted microscope where we put our sample, which are uh, taken in a, in a uh, transparent cover slip, and we bind, to the, uh, bind the sample to the cover slip with some covalent strategy. And then we stain them with different antibodies targeting different surface markers. And these antibodies are also tagged with chlorophyll. So basically, then you can see different intensities here from different particles. These are all single particles. And in this uh, graph, what you see is their integrated intensity. Here, the intensity means what is the abundance of that particular protein that we are measuring. And in the y axis, it shows the count that how many particles have that intensity or have that uh, abundances. So this way we can also stain the particle with three or four different uh, antibodies and four different uh, colors, four different pluralphys, and then we can excite them with different wavelength and then simultaneously study. What you can see here, the red would mean that the intensity coming from one type of marker, and then yellow is for a different one and blue is a third one and so on. And then we can simultaneously analyze, analyze multiple proteins on single particle. At the same time, this, this um, uh, platform has AFM, which are aligned with the optical axis. So while we are analyzing the, the protein abundance on this particle, at the same time, we can measure with the AFM their size and their mechanical properties. So, here is an example how we uh, do this correlated measurement. First, the, the, the fluorescence studies are done, and then we do the AFM measurement on the same sample. And since they are extremely small particle, nanoscale particle, we need to have some surface, um, uh, some, some marks on the surface so that we can identify which particle we are, we are measuring. And from the AFM studies, we can see their size distribution, and then we can overlap uh, the, the, the AFM images and fluorescence images. And then we can, we can ask very interesting questions like the particle which showed certain intensity for one protein, what was the size of that particle or what was their mechanical properties? So we can also study very interesting uh, correlation among different protein profiles. Here, what you see is a HEC-293 cell line derived EVs. So the EVs were taken from this human embryonic kidney cell lines. And these three different proteins were studied on single particles. And what we saw that for these cell lines, when the EVs are analyzed, they seem to have similar uh, dependence on the protein profiles. For example, when CD9 increases on single particle, it also increases CD6 to 3 and CD81. On the other hand, for other cell lines like THP1 or CBMSC, this is not the case. They do not, do not seem to have any correlation between the different proteins on single particle. But if we study these two other cell lines, only between CD63 and CD9, we seems to have very good correlation. Then depending on their, their, uh, their protein abundance, we can cluster them in different subgroups. For example, in this case, the subgroup which has all the three proteins present were most dominant. Whereas in this case, this subgroup having only CD63 on these vesicles were more common. And this is also reflected in their correlative intensity measurement. And then, as I said, normally we would expect these vesicles since they come from the cell. So when the size of the vesicle increases, that should also increase the protein abundance. But this is not what we have found here. What you see is that for certain size around 100 nanometer, the intensity or abundance of CD9 is highest. The same goes for CD63 and CD81. So around 100 nanometer, we have a subpopulation which are very much enriched with proteins. So this 
gives an indication that this this vesicle do not contain some random you know they, they do not carry the biomolecule randomly there is a very sophisticated mechanism that sort of uh, that sort of pack different biomolecule into these vesicles now we also studied uh, the same thing that whether we can follow the treatment response by this single particle analysis again is the same studies where we have this elotinib and osimartin were given to the cell lines and what we see here that this this five marker we have studied the untreated sample typically have very high abundance of all the markers whereas elotinib and osimartin seems to decrease the abundance of the proteins so you also see the same same effect when we study their their intensity distribution for example cd9 uh, this marker doesn't seem to be affected too much. What you see is a violin plot here. This uh, shows uh, the 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 the, the abund I mean the number of particles. The larger the the spread here would mean that much uh, more particles are here in this intensity level and so on. So when you studied CD9, a surface marker, we don't see that much variation with elotinib and osimartinib. The shape of this profile remains more or less similar. But PDL1 seems to have very interesting feature that at this part somewhere here it, it drops. Most uh, dramatic was EGFR, where the, the plot becomes thinner in this level, meaning that majority of particle which was here, uh, uh, they, they are not now that much enriched with EGFR. Now, with that one, I would like to give a short summary of what I have just, just presented. But EVs are very interesting and they hold enormous opportunities for both diagnostic and therapeutics. And there are still a very uh, urgent need to develop methods to analyze this, uh, this interesting uh, biological nanoparticle. And we have developed one microchip based techniques which allows very fast and relatively sensitive um, uh, way of bulk level analysis, that is average analysis of these EVs. And, but, the major challenge in the field is that heterogeneity, which makes it difficult to uh, sort of give a conclusive um, um, understanding of what are their functional role of these vesicles. I mean, when some uh, physiological, uh, pathological uh, things, pathological situation arises, how the functions of the certain population of EVs are changed. And therefore, we need a multi-parametric approach, which we have also developed which shows a simul capacity to simultaneously profile their molecular as well as biophysical characteristics. An investigation of heterogeneity must include many different properties, which is still an active field of research. And we have started this treatment response mo monitoring, and now we are going for a clinical studies with patient sample from Karolinska Hospital. With that one, I would like to thank you. This is a small research group that I have in Uppsala University. And these are two PhD students. They were mostly involved in the single EV and electrokinetic detection, whereas Siddharth and Moin, they helped me with microchip sensor development theory and fabrication. And uh, the funding, we received funding from many Swedish in, uh, institutes and also European Commission. And thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dev, for a nice presentation. So, um, dear colleagues, I would like to give you a short overview about the uh, project towards the development of a biohybrid plant. So, this is a very short introduction about myself. So, I'm consultant for cardiac surgery and emergency physician and deputy head of the Lower Saxony Center for Biomedical Engineering Implant Research and Development for the area tissue engineering. And I got two working groups. The, one, the first one is biohybrid lung and the second one is um, ex vivo organ perfusion. So um, what is needed to realize the intracorporeal biohybrid lung with endothelialized hollow fiber membranes? So first, we achieved the general possibility to endothelialize the PMP hollow fiber membrane. On the left side, a Tamra stain, this one, uh, an unspecific protein stain indicating, um, yeah, indicating all the endothelial cells on the PMP hollow fiber membranes of the biohybrid lung. Um, 
The middle figure shows you a DAPI stain indicating the viable endothelial cells. And on the right side, a VE cadherine staining showing the intercellular junctions of the endothelial cells providing uh, the confluent endothelial monolayer on these hollow fiber membranes, which we have, um, which we got out from the extra corporal membrane oxygenators. Um, Furthermore, we could prove the inactivated and non-thrombogenic state of the endothelial cells on the PMP hollow fiber membranes equal to the endothelial cells on the tissue culture plates. This is tissue culture plate and this is PMP, the um, gas exchange membranes. And this was proven by quantitative RT-PCR of the endothelial cell specific activation markers, ICAM, VCAM and E-selectin and the thrombogenic state markers, tissue factor, and thrombomodulin. Additionally, the data indicated the physiologic reactivation of both cell types towards the TNF-alpha stimulation, which you can see here when we have the white bars. These are the untreated, the unstimulated endothelial cells, and the red bars are the stimulated one where we use TNF-alpha for their stimulation, and you see that we have comparable levels of the relative expression levels of the activation markers and the thrombogenic state markers when we have the cells on the tissue culture plate and on the PMP hollow fiber membrane. This slide shows you the improved hemocompatibility of the endothelialized PMP membranes compared to the native ones. Um, the native ones which are used in the extracorporeal membrane oxygenator are um, coated with heparin albumin and these are the native PMP membranes and we have endothelialized them to improve the hemocompatibility towards the development of the biohybrid lung. So uh, the quantification of the adherent thrombocytes revealed the highest number of native uh, on native PMP. You can see that here. Um, even prior, um, prior the TNF alpha stimulation of the endothelial cells, which you can see here, indicated significantly lower adherent thrombocytes um, on the endothelialized PMP membranes compared to the native one to the unendothelialized ones. And this was also proven by microscopic analyzers and scanning electronic uh, microscopic analyzers. Here you can see different activation status of the thrombocytes on this figure. Um, you see the podocytes of the thrombocytes and different activation status of the thrombocytes um, on the native PMP membranes compared to only a few uh, adherent thromb uh, thrombocytes on the endothelialized PMP membrane. Um, furthermore, the unimpaired gas transfer of the endothelialized PMP could also be shown, which we analyzed in a custom made perfusion chamber over here, in which we have clamped the PMP in so that we create an upper and a lower compartment and the test liquid was applied to the upper compartment and the gas perfusion uh, in the lower compartment. Following the gas transfer um, over time was calculated, um, that means over the native or, the, or over the uh, endothelialized PMP membranes, indicating no significant differences between the native and the endothelialized PMP membrane. That means also for O2 and CO2, there was no significant influence due to the, or due to the endothelialization of the PMP membranes compared to the native one. Another important requirement is the flow resistance of the endothelial monolayer on the PMP membranes. And using our own uh, custom-made flow chamber over here, uh, uh, which was constructed following the original extracorporeal membrane oxygenation oxygenator, we could show an inactivated and non thrombogenic state of the endothelial, of the endothelial cells um, under different flow conditions. You see here 15 to 90 milliliters per minute for up to six hours at a maximum of 90 milliliters per minute. Um, you see, uh, as I mentioned, an inactivated and non thrombogenic status. Um, despite the flow application towards the endothelialized PMP membrane. And the immune fluorescent staining uh, revealed the viable confluent endothelial monolayer after six hours. These four figures um, after six hours of perfusion, um, but when we extended the perfusion time up to 24 hours, um, we see less attached endothelial cells after these 24 hours of flow exposure. And therefore, one uh, major research focus was the optimization of the flow resistance of these endothelial monolayer on the PMP membranes. 
First, we tested commercially available hollow fiber membranes, but the heparin albumin coated PMP showed the best results of the adherent endothelial cells. And then we functionalized the hydrophobic PMP surface by different coatings to improve the endothelial adhesion um, uh, using um, fibrinating and titanium dioxide. And we see on both M um, coatings that we have an inactivated and viable endothelial monolayer which reduces a thrombocyte adhesion, that means improves the hemocompatibility, generating interalia collagen 4 as a basal laminar-like matrix, resulting in a better flow resistance of the whole endothelial monolayer. And the advantage of the fibronectin uh, is that we have here the possibility for in-house coating and the titanium dioxide, we have to uh, do that, or this has to be done by incorporation partner. Um, furthermore, the titanium dioxide in that way, which we used actually or currently, um, we see an impact on the gas transfer rate as we have not only the endothelial cells, but also the coating and therefore the gas transfer is uh, impacted when we have the titanium dioxide coating. Um, to additionally improve the um, relevant cell cell adhesions to resist um, or to better resist the flow conditions, a special flow adaption protocol was also established and growth um, factors in the cell medium were partly um, deleted as they weaken, let me say, the cell cell adhesion and we saw um, you know, weakened the VE cadherin staining and therefore we just um, let out um, some of these um, growth factors in the endothelial cell meat. Um, furthermore, another important um, requirement is the identification of a suitable cell source. Um, doubtless, autologous endothelial cells um, would be the ideal cell source, um, but the isolation from the autologous vessels um, show a very low proliferation rate and um, from the peripheral blood, they just show a very low recovery rate. Um, so therefore, allergenic endothelial cells have a high proliferation potential compared to the autologous one, but a constant and also a constant endothelial phenotype and the generation of a large amount of cells is possible. But um, the disadvantage is the high variability of the HLA molecules which are initiating the humoral and cellular immune response, resulting in the cell rejection if you would use these allergenic endothelial cells to create the biohybrid lung to endothelialize these PMP membranes. So, but the functional inactivation of, um, of the lentiviral vector encoding for the beta-2 microglobulin results in the, inhibition, in the inhibition of the HLA class 1 formation making these allergenic endothelial cells, these HLA silenced endothelial cells to an universal applicable cell source with no T and no, no um, NK cell activation. So um, the lentiviral vector with the specific um, SHRNA targeting for the beta-2 microglobulin leads to the decrease of the beta-2 microglobulin mRNA levels, which we can see here. Here we have the negative control, the, let me say the normal endothelial cells. Here we have the HLA silenced endothelial cells, and here we have um, just only applied the lentiviral vector um, uh, encoding for non-specific um, regions. And here we see a, a significant decrease in the beta-2 microglobulin um, when we just use the lentiviral vector encoding for the beta-2 microglobulin. Um, furthermore, um, this resulted in the decrease of the HLA class 1 expression on the cell surface, which we can see here in the fax analysis. We have here the negative control, the non-specific silence, and here the beta-2 microglobulin-specific silence and ethereal cells. And also we can see here in this fax analysis a decrease of the beta-2 of the HLA class 1 on the cell surface. Furthermore, um, it results in significantly lower T cell and used cell lysis and K cell and N complement activation without having any impact on the endothelial genome and phenotype. Besides the HLA silenced endothelial cells, um, induced pluripotent stem cell derived endothelial cells were analyzed for the potential to be used for the biohybrid lung, um, indicating a viable inactivated monolayer, um, which you can see here by this staining. 
Um, also showing the cell-cell interconnections, proving also by the VE cadherin staining, which I just show you, uh, showed you in the beginning of my presentation. They are also flow resistant. Um, here we have um, produced uh, some kind of cell gap. And when we applied some kind of flow exposure, we could see that within a few hours, um, this area, which was, um, yeah, was destroyed before, um, was, was re-endothelialized uh, under this flow conditions um, only um, using four to six hours. And also um, interesting um, that the um, yeah, IPS cells induce protein stem cell derived endothelial cells show um, these some kind of um, cell healing capacity and they just um, show um, yeah, compared to the other endothelial cells, higher proliferation capacities compared to some kind of other endothelial cells. And this um, is very ideal um, just to endothelialize these PMP hollow fiber membranes, um, just to create the biohybrid lung based on the ECMO technology. As mentioned in the beginning, the biohybrid lung um, will be pump driven or, or has to be pump driven and therefore the left ventricular assist device seems to be suitable for this challenge. Um, but having also um, big disadvantages um, of the artificial surfaces with very low hemocompatibility, as we know from the clinical setting, especially the inflow cannula, which you can see here, which is just put in the apex of the heart. Uh, and but also um, the region, the impeller region um, of the left ventricular assist device. These are the prone regions where these um, thrombus formations um, start. They're generating and um, yeah, lead to the um, Elbert thrombus formation. <clears throat> so on the left uh, figure, you see some kind of fibrin depositions on these um, inflow cannulas and, and thrombus formation in the left ventricular assist device, so in the impeller region, um, which lead to the, yeah, the destroyment of the, of the patient's blood and therefore the left ventricular assist device has to be exchanged. Um, so, but nevertheless, by the endothelialization of this impeller region, which you can see here in these four um, figures, um, here you can see the, um, Sinter titanium dioxide material where the impeller is made from. You can see here these um, yeah, uh, different endothelial cells which just cover the inflow um, area um, from this left ventricular assist device. And here by this fluorescence microscopy, you can see that we have also the um, attachment of the endothelial cells or between the endothelial cells and the, that these endothelial cells just are a viable endothelial cells. And furthermore, we could prove that the endothelialization of this inflow cannula also leads to a better hemocompatibility of this areas. Um, as you can see here, um, the fibrin depositions on the native sintered inflow cannula compared to the endothelialized one, where you can see significantly lower thrombocyte adhesion and fibrin depositions. Um, further translational aspects um, which should be mentioned towards the development of the biohybrid lung um, is that we have to establish um, appropriate um, yeah, animal models to assess the prototype under systemic and disease relevant conditions. Um, that means, um, for example, we just have established um, the rat model and the rat ECMO as a small animal model. And furthermore, you, uh, I'll just um, yeah, explain that uh, next slides that we have also established uh, the PIC model and the PIC uh, ECMO just to test the biohybrid lung um, under workload conditions and also under disease relevant conditions. That means that the biohybrid lung should be the alternative to the lung transplant and therefore you have to test the biohybrid lung um, when they run in parallel to the diseased run to the diseased lungs, for example, when the patients 
um, have these kind of end stage lung diseases, for example, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases or fibrosis or something like that. And therefore, you have to um, analyze the interaction between the biohybrid lung and the diseased lungs. And therefore, we have established the small and large animal models. And furthermore, to assess the, the respective prototypes and um, towards their immunogenicity, um, especially just to test the HMA or HLA silence, MHC silence, and the thigia cells, and the immunogenicity, but also the um, induced pluripotent stem cell derived endothelial cells. But furthermore, to test the thrombogenicity of our biohybrid lung when we apply the um, the whole blood, um, not only um, testing that with thrombocyte specific assays, so but also when we have all the um, yeah all the whole blood, um, all the factors for the um, uh, traumogenicity. Furthermore, we also have to apply um, clinical relevant flow applications. Um, when I showed you the data um, for the flow activation um, up to 90 milliliters per minute, that was just only that we have the complete, um, yeah, the, the comp or that was just for the red ECMO model um that we have here the complete hazard v of the of the red model and when we just apply that in the large animal models we have to apply um, for example up to five liters per minute so therefore we have to test the flow resistance of the cells compared to the different um coating strategies and compared to the different yeah, endothelialized pmp hollow fiber membranes and furthermore we have to um yeah, test the um, gas transfer capacity of the whole blood when we have the hemoglobin and all, all the other stuff. And um, also we have to test that in the acute and, uh, acute and chronic application. And finally, we have to um, yeah, test that, um, that the specific cannulation and implantation techniques of the biohybrid lung, which uh, in the end should be implanted intracorporeal. So, but in the first times we will test that when we have the biohybrid like extra extracorporeal. But in the in the very future, we have to implant the biohybrid lung as alternative to lung transplantation um, intracorporeal. So um, with respect to the large animal model, we established the acute lung injury models to mimic the diseased um, patients and um, to test the biohybrid lung activation. So we have the acute and chronic animal models. And here, for example, um, just a CT scan uh, for the acute uh, animal model. You can see here the, the impact on the uh, lungs and that we have an impaired gas transfer capacity of the native lungs. And this is our acute um, lung injury model. And furthermore, for our PIC models, um, we have um, successfully isolated and characterized um, pure endothelial cells from the PIC that we just not move to the xenogenic and will be stay in the allergenic model. And we have established um, quantitative RT-PCR primer pairs, and we have um, successfully transferred our seeding protocols um, of the hollow fiber membranes um, using these um, pig endothelial cells and expose them to flow conditions for up to 48 hours. And you can see here our first results. Um, this is after perfusion. These are the non-seeded, the non-endothelialized PMP hollow fiber membranes, where you can see um, or where we applied whole blood for six hours for 60 milliliters per minute. And you can see here thrombus formation after these six hours. And also here in the scanning electron microscopy, you can see here the thrombus formation and compared to this, and um, this is a PMP hollow fiber membrane, which we have endothelialized before. And first you can see that the endothelial cells are stable after these six hours um, are stable on the hollow fiber membranes. And also you can see no significant fibrin depositions or thrombocyte um, adhesion on these endothelialized hollow fiber membranes. So, and now I'd like to thank all of you um, uh, for your attention. And I'd like to thank all the collaboration partners and the German Center for Lung Research and the uh, German Research Foundation, which su who supported us um, that we can just proceed with our uh, biohybrid lung development. Thanks, uh, Dr. Wigman, for a very nice presentation. Is there any question or comment for her?
um, maybe I can ask a question. Uh, sure. I was I was wondering about this biohybrid lungs. So does it also uh, work better in terms of like uh, some uh, vulnerabilities of normal heart, normal lungs that, for example, lung cancer and uh, for COVID, for example? Um, so we can just also apply that for patients having lung cancer or COVID um, and we can may use that um, uh, temporarily. So as we have also established a protocol that we will be able to um, to have these endothelial cells and or to have these endothelialized, let me say, extracorporeal membrane oxygenators of the cell uh, of the shelf use. So we can store that under hypothermic conditions and yeah, rewarm our endothelialized biohybrid lung, uh, which will uh, therefore or when we use these HLA silent endothelial cells, um, we can just apply that to any of the patients in the future and. That we can store that. Uh, that means that we can produce the biohybrid lung in advance, so that we can also apply that that for COVID patients, which would be the let me say the acute patients, but also for let me say for lung cancer patients. Yes. Um, so, but the general idea was just to have that developed um, as alternative lung transplantation, especially for these patients, which are maybe, for example, too old or um, are on the waiting list for more than one year or something like that and, the, um, and getting worse and worse. And so this uh, should be the alternative to lung transplant. Oh, very interesting. And thank you for clearing it up.